You said less meat, better. These guys have more meat, they're doing better. These guys are having more plants, less meat, they're doing worse. So your studies are crap. If a study disagrees with reality, it's wrong, period. Oh, but there's this study that said, I don't care. First of all, the majority of studies come from the food and drug industry. Coca-Cola, just Coca-Cola, not Kellogg's, Pepsi, Nestle, General Mills, all the rest of them. Just Coca-Cola spends 11 times the amount of money on nutritional research every year than the National Institutes of Health. NIH. The vast majority of these studies are put out by the companies trying to sell you this shit. Welcome to the Plant Free MD podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Okay, hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone everywhere. Uh, thanks for coming on my live. So this is for September 29th in Australia, September 28th in the US. And uh, welcome, good to see everyone. If you guys, one of the reasons this name is just fake person. That's always funny. Um, if you guys wanna put in the comments where you guys are calling in from, and um, anyone has a questions, just put question and uh, I'll go through those and try to answer them as best I can. All right, see if anyone's down here now. Hello from Brazil. Jack, hello, how are you? The, well, all right, when, when, until the questions start coming, I guess we'll talk about uh, you know, Maggie's um, Maggie's fundraiser, so are still doing that. It's on Give, Send, Go. That's reached probably about, well, what would it be, about three quarters or, well, between two-thirds and three-quarters of, of the way there. And so that's amazing. So thank you very much, everyone who's donated to that. Thank you, everyone to, that has uh, contributed. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for the super chat. I appreciate that. And um, if there's a question that wants to go with that, just put that in, in the chat and I'll, I'll hit it as well. And yeah, so, so we're still trying to get more. We're trying to get up to uh, 50,000 Canadian dollars. That's how much she needs to keep her herd and not have to uh, sell off any to, to afford to pay for the rest. But um, we're well on our way. And um, you know, it's already made a huge, huge, huge difference in her life and um and uh for her herd and so that will make a huge difference because that has a knock-on effect right because if she has to sell half her herd now she has to sort of regrow and try to build back and build back and buy more and things like that as she goes and that's difficult it takes years to get your herd back up and so it's uh, and the herd sizes are just going down and down because no one can afford to keep their cows now and so you know, they go to auction and it's not other ranchers buying the cows. It's the, you know, the packing plants buying the cows and then they, you know, uh, turn into beef and, and all that. But, um, that means that more cows are going into, to make beef than normal. And it, um, it means smaller herd sizes. And so the herd sizes in, in that area are, are going down and that's a problem because it takes a while to build those back up. So we've seen a lot of people from, from all over. So a lot from Canada and the U.S. and New Zealand. It's great. And Bay Area, California. Very cool. My uncle uh, lived in Half Moon Bay. We should go up to see him when we go up from Southern California. Louisiana, awesome. I've only been to New Orleans. I haven't been outside of that, um, seeing the rest of Louisiana. That would be really cool to see the rest of them. And, uh, and yeah, and if people could uh, hit the like button, um, that helps, you know, just helps drive things up and helps the algorithm spit this out and suggest this to more people uh, as we're going, which is, uh, which is, you know, we just get more people involved, which is good. So the super chat here from DM. Thank you very much for that. Hi, doctor on carnivore two months and love it. Learning a ton from you. Well, that's good. It's good to hear. I like taking a Metamucil. Any negative impacts if I still want to take it? Thank you. So Metamucil, you know, it's just a, a fiber supplement, really. So do you need fiber? 
Probably not. It, you know, it's, it's just a bulking agent that, you know, for these purposes, it's a bulking agent so that you can sort of move your stools, but your, your, your stools are going to pass normally uh, and better if you just eat more fat. And so if you're getting blocked up, if you're getting dry, hard stools, then you, you need to eat more fat uh, by definition. And so, um, you know, people say, well, I'm definitely eating enough fat, but I'm still having hard, dry stools. So to me, if you have hard, dry stools, then by definition, you are not eating enough fat because if you're eating enough fat, you'll get overflow, you'll get, you won't be able to absorb all of it. And some of that will get in your stools. You'll keep it soft. and It'll go out. And so that's, that's definitional for me. If you're, if you're getting dry, hard stools, you're not eating enough fat. If it's just in frequency that you're worried about, you're only going once or twice a week and you're normally used to going three, four times a day. Don't worry about that because you're absorbing 98% of the meat that you're eating. Whereas when you're eating plants, you're not absorbing, you know, 90, 95% of the plant because most of the plant is made out of the structural component of fiber and you can't absorb that and it has to go out. You have to excrete it. So with the Metamucil, um, you, you don't need it, you know, because you don't need that bulking to, to move things through and just have something to, I mean, you, your body doesn't, it's like, it's like, oh my God, if, if, if I don't have anything to move through my bowels, everything shuts down. Your, your body's fine with that. I mean, think about fasting, you know, people fast for a number of days. They, they don't, they don't die of bowel obstructions and, and uh, complications of, of colon disease right they actually they actually do better and when you're you're you get surgery on your bowels like you rest the bowel like you either fast or you take in low residue diet so no fiber diet right that's um that's a good thing also remember that fiber is um sort of think of it as a solid component it can cause like a lining and just basically physically gets in the way between your enzymes and the food and then digested so, so it doesn't digest as much and then digested food and your gut lining so it impedes digestion and absorption and that's and that's a benefit supposedly that people say that well this is good because it, it blocks 30 percent of the the absorption of the food so that you're not getting you're not absorbing all this horrible crap you're eating okay well you're not eating ho anything horrible that you don't want to absorb on a carnivore diet so if you reduce by 30% or even 5% the amount of meat that you're eating, that's actually detrimental. You want to absorb all of this stuff because it's all good for you. If you're eating a whole bunch of sugar and, uh, and other sort of plant toxins, great. You know, fiber is going to stop you from absorbing as much of that. Maybe that's a positive. There are studies suggesting, uh, it can be positive. There's other studies that say, saying that it's not positive. There's a study with over 2000 people that showed that people who had more fiber had higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So that's not great. And we're more symptomatic with constipation. They were getting hard, difficult to pass, painful stools, bleeding, fissures, bloating, all these sorts of things. They reduced the fiber. Those symptoms got better. They eliminated fiber. They resolved. They all, <laughs> those symptoms all resolved. So, you know, studies aren't perfect. But if you just think of the mechanism, what is it doing? Well, it's bulking, it's moving things through. You don't need that. You just eat enough fat. Okay, what else is it doing? It's blocking out nutrients that you want to absorb when you're on a carnivore diet. So for us, it's not necessary. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think you need it. If you're, if you're worried about it and, you just, and you're just having difficult to pass stools, just eat more fat. You'll be fine. Russell Sheridan. Do you think including butter and fat makes, uh, including butter slash fat makes a better health, worse health, or no health difference if included in plant based meals? No, I think it's better, 100% better. Fat is an essential nutrient. It's that, you know, people say, it was like, oh, you don't want too much fat. I don't, I don't think that's a thing. I think that's, um, I, I think that's just thinking about it a bit differently than, uh, than our body uses it. Our body has a limited capacity to absorb fat. You know, with the amount of bile that our liver makes without bile it's very difficult for your body to absorb fat and so i think that the amount of bile your body makes is the amount of fat that your body wants i don't think your body just makes a random amount of bile to get a random amount of fat that that, that wouldn't make sense to me physiologically 
and biologically because other things are so tightly controlled. Why would this one just be completely random? So I think that your body wants the fat and needs the fat. And they say, okay, well, but if you're eating all this junk and junk food and carbs and sugar, then it's bad. No, <laughs> you know, like it's like, it's like saying that, you know, uh, you know, uh, another nutrient like, you know, protein or, or, you know, these essential amino acids, well, those are bad for you. If you eat uh, even with carbs, why would that be? They're essential. You need them. The carbs are the bad thing. And well, but with, with fat, then you'll get too many calories. No, it's an essential nutrient. That's, that's how I think about it. So yes, you know, if you're eating, if you're eating vegetables and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, plant-based meals or whatever, at least at the very least, you're getting these essential animal-based fats and nutrients. You need these things. And so a lot of, a lot of harm and, and what I think we call diseases are a byproduct of not eating the right thing, partly because you're eating things that our bodies have a hard time dealing with, like non-bioavailable nutrients and uh, direct toxins or things that disrupt your hormones or your digestion or draw out nutrients, things like that, but also just not having the essential nutrients that we need. So that combination of causing us harm and not having correct nutrition is a problem. And so if you're having a plant-based meal, but you know, that that's, if, it, if it's purely plant-based, it's not going to have all the essential nutrients you need. And there are essential fatty acids and essential fat soluble vitamins that you have to have. And so if you're adding in animal fat, or butter, then yes, that's better. <laughs> that's definitely better because you're getting you're getting more nutrients, and you're getting more of the nutrients that you need. And uh, and fats are really good for you. It's uh, it's very very good for you. Your brain is made out of fat. Your nervous system is made out of fat. Your whole body is made out of cholesterol. Your hormones are made out of cholesterol. This is a really important uh, nutrient. So yes, at any point, uh, even if you're eating horrible crap, if you're eating it with something good for you, that good thing for you is still good for you. It doesn't all of a sudden become bad for you. It's just, it's the other stuff that's, that is and remains bad for you. Lisa, Lisa, thank you very much for the super jet. It's very kind of you. And, um, I'm very generous. Hi doc. Thank you as always for what you do. Uh, what's your advice for a carnivore, uh, an ALS, a friend of mine, uh, diagnosed a few months ago. Um, Beg in mouth, Boston. Um, so ALS is is a tough one. So I don't I don't know enough people that have been on carnivore with ALS. I've only sort of heard peripherally, like from yourself, you know that, that they've had a friend, and and would this be something that would help them? Um, I haven't actually seen anyone get on this and try. So I don't know. Um, unfortunately, there are things that can cause serious problems and harm and uh and that that diet's not going to fix i think that it would help them in in so far as it would eliminate out a lot of other garbage that they wouldn't have to contend with while they're dealing with the als now is that going to slow stop halt or reverse the als i have no idea i, I hope so i would hope so and there are some things that seem to be very dependent on diet. So for instance, in the animal kingdom, this is something I learned when I went up to Maggie's ranch, she was telling me, she, you know, she went to veterinary school and she's basically been the vet for her or a major part. I mean, she does like cesareans on her cows when, when needed, you know, so she's very up on, uh, you know, animal issues and cow issues. There is a, um, a disorder that cows get, which is their version of mus muscular dystrophy. Now we look at muscular dystrophy and that, oh, that's genetic and that's all there is to it. Um, and there's certainly a genetic component, um, but in at least in the cow version, it comes down to a genetic component, cows that are susceptible to this, and they have a, a nutritional deficiency. I believe she said it was selenium. And so you add in selenium into the feed because sometimes they don't have all the nutrients in the feed or in the grass or in the hay or whatever. And so if they get deficient, then they, they, they can get this muscular dystrophy. And so when they add in selenium or, or whatever the, the um, nutrient was, if anyone knows, please put that in the comments and we can, <laughs> I can stop guessing. Um, 
then uh, then they don't have it anymore and reverses. So, and there are so many weird things that people have that just go away. So, I mean, I've seen people with Ehlers Danlos, which is a connective tissue issue, <laughs> connective tissue issue, connective tissue disorder, and uh, I see people basically become non symptomatic with that, and normally you'll have joint dislocations and a pain in their joints and and uh, and other problems. And then all of a sudden, pain's gone, joint dislocations are gone, their joints work better, and the connective tissue is tougher and stronger and tighter. Pretty amazing. So there are, gen there are genetic components and there are also nutritional components. So with ALS, that's something I'm very curious about. That's something that I, that I, I hope I can have some patients and people like your friend who give this a try and I would, I would be happy to work with them directly and, and help them out as best I can to make sure that they succeed and, um, and to see how they do, because that's, that's a very important piece of information. And, uh, but, you know, just optimizing your life in general, getting proper sleep, you know, getting the light blocking glasses, getting sunlight, being out in the sun, going back to our, our normal circadian rhythms, you know, walking around barefoot, you know, I don't know much about grounding, but there does seem to be an electron transfer, like, you know, current transfer, you know, through the body when you walk barefoot. So presumably that's how we were designed. Is it how much of a difference it makes? I have no idea, but it is there. It is a phenomenon that you can measure. And certainly the light in the eyes and, and getting tracked onto your circadian rhythm, that is, that is known to be a major issue and uh and then the proper food so you know getting proper sleep circadian rhythm proper food and again eliminating out all those other things that are certainly going to make life worse for everyone and especially compound things for someone with als like you do that and you address those things and um it's at least going to help them from that sense and uh, and improve things that can be improved um, and I would hope that it would improve ALS, uh, but I don't, I don't know, unfortunately, but I would still recommend just pure fatty red meat and water and nothing else. I mean, with these sorts of things, you just want to be as, as, as pure as possible, you know, grass fed and finished from a regenerative farm if you can, and just, just really do it the best that you can to give yourself the best shot at, at succeeding. And if, if, uh, your friend is interested and wants to, talk to me directly. I'm happy to, to talk to them you know, for free and, and just try to help them out as, as much as I can. Um, I have my email I put in there for, um, for collaborations and, you know, things like that. It's just Anthony at gmail.com. Um, and if they're interested, you know, just have them email me. I don't see all the emails. So if I don't get it, just bump it up a couple of times until I do. But I, I would be more than happy to help and hopefully they give it a try and hopefully it helps. Question from Sen Offwar. I have a question. Do we know how long uh, the opposite of fat adaption takes? Like once you are fat adapted, how long does it take to become carb adapted? Uh, it seems to be a few days. So it's not too long. So uh, looking at Professor Ben Bickman, um, you know, he talks about different studies that, uh, well, that that incorrectly say that a ketogenic diet makes you insulin resistant. How how could that happen if you're not even if you have low insulin, right? Um, I mean, I guess you could you could affect insulin receptors and and all that, but you know, doesn't really follow. Um, the way they measured that is they just did a glucose tolerance test. So they gave someone a soda and they said, oh, look, their blood sugar went up uh, higher and it took longer to come down, okay? Um, but did you check your insulin at the same time? Their insulin was low. So if their insulin was high and it took a long time for that to come down, that's insulin resistance because there's a lot of insulin out and not a lot of happening, right? Whereas um, what happens in people in ketosis, their insulin is low. And so the blood sugar goes up, insulin's still low, and it takes a little while to rise up. Why is that? That's because normally when you're eating a lot of carbohydrates, your, your pancreas preloads insulin, pre-makes it, and has it sitting there ready to go, right? And then you eat carbohydrates, and it goes, get it out there, because you know, you're know you building up a tolerance for a toxin, really. And so you know, when you're an alcoholic, 
you know, or, or drinking regularly, your body makes more of these enzymes that break down uh, alcohol, right? So you can get this the hell out of your system as quickly as possible. And so that's the same with carbs. And so you're pre-making insulin because that's the, the counter for carbs, uh, you know, blood sugar that's too high. So when you're not doing that and you're, and you're, you're just eating, you know, uh, a normal human diet, uh, you don't have to pre-make your insulin because that's not an issue. And so uh, at first, you don't have enough insulin to bowl us out and slam out and drop it like other people do. But in a couple of days, you start doing that again. So if, according to, to Professor Bickman, who has been studying insulin and its effects on the body for 15 plus years, um, you know, he's a professor at BYU. Uh, he has literally written a book on the subject. So, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what he says. It's, so it should just take a couple of days. It's not, it's not that big a deal. It's not really going to like knock you back. I mean, you already run on carbs, right? Because when you, but you just make them yourself. And so you, you get energy up, you know, burn, you know, break down fat, uh, from your fat tissue. Some, you know, some of these nutrients go to your liver, your liver makes, glucose and glycogen and things like that. So you always have glucose and glycogen. So in that sense, you're always carb adapted because you're always running on carbs anyway. You check your blood sugar, it's normal. It's always normal. And that's how that's how we know what normal is. That's where it's supposed to be. That's where your body wants it to be. And so when you um when you're on a ketogenic diet, carnivore diet, everything's everything's normal you are running on carbs so you are carb adapted but you're also keto adapted you're also able to run on ketones and carbohydrates so when you go back to eating carbohydrates it's not that you can't run on carbohydrates anymore it's just that it takes a couple of days for your you start pre-making insulin again because you're like, oh jesus we're doing this again okay fine uh, and then it just shuts down your ketones really so the only difference is, is that you just don't have access to your ketones anymore but your blood sugar was always there and it was always able to be used. So I wouldn't worry. Um, yeah. So in that, in that respect, you're always carb adapted. Let's grab coffee says started the carnivore diet and feel much better already from Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. That's great. I'm glad you're doing better. And I hope that, uh, you know, I, I'm sure it will just keep getting better after that. So, uh, good luck with it. Keep going and, uh, you'll keep getting better as you go. Brian games, uh, brain games, maybe, uh, back, uh, thank, thank you for super chat it says back surgery for, uh, CES in 2018 leg muscle loss from neuropathy as a result. Um, CES stands for caught Aquinas syndrome for people that don't know. Uh, I am, uh, which is sort of a compression of the lower nerve roots in the, in the lumbar spine. So the spinal cord ends at around L1 and then sort of the nerve roots come down. That's the cauda equina. It means horse's tail in Latin. And if that gets compressed, you can get cauda equina syndrome. So you compress those nerves and causes causes problems. It's not good. It's, it's an emergency. So I'm sure uh, the nerves have healed as much as they will. The muscle continues to degrade. Will I eventually lose ability to walk? Well, hopefully not. The, the, the muscles that are normally afflicted by a cauda equina um, are usually sort of lower down. And so it shouldn't necessarily affect all the ones up in, in your hip and things like that. It depends on the, the level of your compression, but the, um, you know, things like, well, it, yeah, it, it does just depend on where, on where your, your compression was, but, um, it can, it can certainly cause difficulty to walk. It can cause you to have a drop foot where you can't lift your foot up, you know, can't walk properly. Uh, you can have weakness and, um, but, but it shouldn't make you completely paralyzed from the waist down unless it's a high up lesion, which, you know, again, I don't know what, what level your lesion was, but the thing is, is that it, it shouldn't continue to get really worse and worse and worse. I mean, you know, you, you can have atrophy because the, the, the muscles aren't being innervated and that can continue to atrophy. Uh, but if you keep working at it and working at it, what is left can grow and if, and, and, and can grow and develop and you're just stimulating it. So the more you do, the more you'll stimulate 
um, the more you stimulate the growth and it can even stimulate the nerves to, to work a little better. Um, so 2018, so that's a while. Normally we sell, tell people that after about two years, you're going to get whatever recovery you've gotten. That's how much you can expect to, to keep and maintain. Now that said, you know, you, you just have someone and say, okay, well, you know, you got out of high school and you're this big and you're that athletic and that's what you're going to be. You're, you're a grown adult and that's how much you're going to be. Well, you can develop where you, you know, you know, where you, you ended up with in your development. Right. Mm -hmm. So an adult, I've, I've been in my adult frame since I was 17 or 18, but I, I was a hundred I, you know, I was 177 pounds, um, at 17 and now I'm 240. you know, so my frame is the same, but I was able to develop the muscles after that. Right. So that's what you can do. You know, you can build things up as much as you can. Also, if you're on a carnivore diet, and it doesn't say if you are or aren't, I've seen pretty amazing recoveries neurologically. Now, that doesn't mean any, everyone will, but I have seen some crazy things happen. There's a guy, Dave Mack, who I've had on the podcast and I've been on his, um, that, um, you know, he's, uh, and he's on, on YouTube and everything like that. You guys can go check it out. And uh, he had a stroke when he was 19 or so, you know, late teenager. And, and for 30 years, he had very stable neurology. He had, he had right-sided weakness forever. And he did a ketogenic diet, which actually helps with neurological recovery. Uh, that's been shown in studies, especially for TBIs, traumatic brain injuries. And, uh, and we know for epilepsy and migraines and, and these sorts of things too, we know that, that it helps a lot. So, you know, he 30 years later went on a carnivore diet and within months he was walking normally and, and, uh, significantly reduced the amount of weakness that he had from a stroke that was 30 years old. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing what our body can do if we just get out of its way and what can, can recover. So that's what I would do. If you're not on carnivore diet, get on one and just try beef and water, fatty beef and water. Get a lot of fat in there. Your brain and your nervous system is made out of fat and cholesterol. So that's what you need. And um, and then just give it time. And I would just get get in the gym working with a, a physical therapist and an occupational therapist and try and work on as much as you can and try to give him back as much function as you can and at least stop it from, from getting worse. If, if the more you work at it, um, the more you'll be able to preserve and hopefully reverse. So good luck with that. Um, oh goodness. There we go. So Jerry Graham, thank you for the super chat. Just had labs showing B12 of 999 been eating ketovore and organ meats. How long should I avoid organs and other advice to lower B12 before I get new labs? My doctor is requesting. Um, never. I think that, uh, that's a perfect score. Honestly, uh, pretty cool. Triple nine. But so I don't know what country you're in and they use slightly different values, but they, they balance out to be sort of the same in the U S and Australia and Europe and things like that in Australia. Um, the reference range is like, depending on you know, now the reference ranges change, change everywhere. Uh, even from lab to lab in the same city, because they go by the average population that that lab has seen that year. Right. And so they change every year and they change every lab that you go to. And so that's not accurate, right? That's not telling you where you should be. That's just telling you, do you fall in the range of everybody else? Well, everyone else is sick, right? Everyone else is unwell and metabolically unhealthy and nutritionally deficient. So that's not the, that's not the metric you want to you know, compare yourself to. Okay. Those aren't the people you want to compare yourself to. So the reference range in Australia is like 160 to 650 or thereabouts, depending on, on where you are. And yet below 400 is, um, has been shown to cause uh, demyelination of your axon. So nerve damage in uh, people. So under 400 is a, is a true deficiency where your body is not able to maintain a uh, normal function right? So not good. So that's half of the reference range, right? So you'd be 200 and like, oh, that's normal. You know, 300. Yeah, fine. 
420 geez oh, look you're you're doing really well you're upper upper half right no that's um that's really low so the range that that i look at is if you're 25 and you have no medical issues what does your what do your numbers look like and so for b12 that's 800 to 1200 so you're snack in the middle of that if you're in australia in america it's slightly higher sort of i think it's like a thousand to 1500 or something like that for a, i'll have to go back and look but it's uh, around there anyway so so that's fine to me the only problem is that while wow, that's way too high is because we are you know most people are nutritionally deficient and b12 deficient and so you're comparing yourself against people that that don't have enough and so it looks like you're too high but you know in the in the land of the blind the one one eyed man is king right so you have you know you're you're doing better than them and it looks like this, this crazy disparity and um but it's not actually your normal they are abnormal so i'd be fine with what you're doing um you know, organ meats are fine in proportion to the animal, right? So if you're hunting and you take down an animal, just remember that you get hundreds of pounds of normal muscle meat and fat, you know, to every pound of organ, right? You've got one liver, one heart, two kidneys, one spleen, a bunch of intestines, right? And fat, you know, that's, that's a lot of what's in the abdomen is fat. And so, that's what you need to focus on is um, uh, the fat and the muscle meat and organs. Great, but just keep that in proportion. You don't need as much of that. And so as long as you're keeping it in proportion, having, you know, liver and organs a couple times a week, but not in like huge quantities, you'll be fine. And that B12 is is perfectly fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that um, at all. So that, that's perfect. You're doing great. Mark Breyers. Um, if you have health issues going through eating grain, how would that impact your health? If you eat grain fed meat, wouldn't that still cause disease? Um, oh, through eating grain. Yeah. So if you eat grains and you get problems in, in grain fed meat, would that be a problem? Well, it depends. It depends on how well that animal can process the toxins that are in grains or any plant. And so if an animal is eating what it is, does it is designed to eat, then it, can detoxify and eliminate out those problems and uh, and it doesn't get into the meat they're filters for that right um but if that's not what they're designed to eat then no that fi filtration they'll still filter but it won't be won't be perfect right and so this is why some people recommend against eating uh you know uh, factory farmed chicken and pork and farm raised fish because they're being fed corn and soy and garbage like that that they are not designed to eat and um, they don't filter it out perfectly ruminant animals red meat animals with this big rumen this big complex digestive tract um, they seem to be able to do detoxify these things much 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 better now it changes their nutritional complement and you know their omega-3s and omega-6s yeah especially if it's in intensively grain finished. Now, not everyone does that. You know, I was talking to Maggie and Mac up in, in Alberta and other ranchers as well. And when you, you, you add in a bit of grain to help keep them fat through the winter and things like that, um, you're not talking about 95%, 100% grain. You're talking about kicking it up, you know, 30%, 60% grain. The rest of it's like hay and feed and grass and things like that. It's just a sort of a top up. So they're still getting nutrients and all these sorts of things. It's a very different, different way of doing it. And, and you get different results. And so, um, you know, most people, th so that, that actually seems to be okay. And cows can, can, I mean, I saw an article saying that they could get rid of glyphosate, right? They could, they could just burn that stuff out. So that doesn't get in their meat either. So it depends, you know, it's still going to be a filter, but that's, that's why people with autoimmune issues should really stick to red meat because, you know, they, they try pork or chicken and it, and it, and it gives them a reaction and it gives them a flare up of their autoimmunity. So that's probably what that's from is those, those toxins that they're not used to, uh, breaking down and, and chewing up, they can get into the meat. So yes, that can be an issue. And that's why you stick to red meat, grass fed and finished. If you're, if you're ultra sensitive, but most people, even very sensitive people do just fine on even grain finished 
beef and lamb. So just see what, see how you do. If you're finding you're still having uh, a problem, then, um, uh, then uh, just go for grass fed and finished and that then should be fine. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products that will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, Behind. Check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right, thanks, guys. Glenn Condren asks, "What? Uh, what if you've lost your gallbladder?" This is a very common question, um, and uh, I have addressed this on other videos. I should make one just just called this, uh, just so people can look it up. But uh, doesn't matter. Your gallbladder stores bile, but your liver makes the bile. And so your liver is still going to make the bile, it's just going to drip out constantly. And so it may be that you can't absorb as much fat in one meal. So you just need to eat the same amount as your body still needs a certain amount of meat and fat. Uh, you just may need to split those meals up throughout the day. Now, if you're getting loose stools, diarrhea, that means your body's not absorbing as much, a, a lot of the fat that you're, that you're eating. So you need to space that out. And so uh, just still judge by your stools. Most people, actually a lot of people, I don't know the percentages, but a lot of people will form what's called a pseudo gallbladder, which is just an outpouching of the common bile duct. And that um, just works like a normal gallbladder. And so they don't have any problems uh, eating eating a big one, one a day fatty meal as well. So it just depends, but you can still absolutely do it because you still make bile. You just may need to uh, split up your meals, but not necessarily. Joseph, thank you for the super chat. Hi, Dr. Chafee. Thank you for what you do. Been on a strict carnivore uh, carnivore uh, for almost two weeks and already feeling the effects. Great. Question, at what point will the normal hunger pains go away? FYI, Costco ribeyes rock. Yes, they do. Um, uh, usually usually a few weeks. You know, Usually you don't get cravings after a few weeks. Now, if you, you are getting hunger pains and... and, and uh, uh, carb cravings and things like that. You may be under eating. It's very easy to under eat on a carnivore diet. And so you're just like, yeah, I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry. Just eat a little bit or whatever. And I'm fine. But then you start feeling like you're really hungry or you're having like carb cravings. That may be that your brain is screaming at you. You need to eat a hell of a lot more. So you should be eating enough fatty meat that you don't get those feelings. And so if you are eating, bye bye keep eating until it stops tasting good. Not until you feel, yeah, I feel comfortable. Your body still wants it if it tastes good because you get negative feedback. It tastes good now, but the next bite, it tastes slightly less good, slightly less good, and slightly less good until eventually it doesn't taste good. And you just go, hmm, I don't, I don't actually want to eat anymore. And you stop. And that's, I believe, you know, I haven't asked any, I'm, you know, haven't come across Dr. Doolittle, but I would expect that that's the same sensation that other animals get in the wild, certainly the ones that we get. And so that's how your body tracks or tells you how to track what to eat and how much to eat. Um, you start eating other things like carbs and sugar and lectins and things like that, that disrupts your hormones and your satiety signals and blocks leptin and raises insulin and does all these sorts of things that derange your hunger signals and your satiety signals. And then you overeat. It's very easy to overeat and they're addictive. And so you definitely overeat when you do, when you're doing carnivore, you don't have any of that bothering you. So you can actually listen to your signals. So you have to know what to look for. And I think that taste is, is a major component there. If fatty meat tastes good, you are still hungry. You should keep eating until it stops tasting good. Now you, the other side of that, people say, Oh, I'm just getting tired of, of ribeye and Oh gosh. And like try other meat and ugh, it just doesn't taste good. Well, then you're definitely not hungry and you don't need to eat. You don't need to eat just for the sake of eating, right? So, you know, unless you're like completely emaciated or, or something like that or have a, you know, an eating disorder or something like that. And you just, you, this is a survival issue. Um, but, uh, you know, many people I've spoken to with anorexia do very, very well on a carnivore diet and, um, and, and find it much easier to eat and eat a healthy amount and put on weight and be happy about putting on that healthy weight as well. 
So, um, so yeah, so that's what I would suggest. Just make sure you're eating enough. Make sure that you're eating until fatty meat stops tasting good and, uh, and you should be fine. And so you shouldn't, you shouldn't get those, those cravings and those feelings as much if, if you're eating enough. So good luck with that. Send off war. Thank you for the super chat. I have a question. Do we know how long the opposite of fat adaption takes? <laughs> okay, so we already asked that one. So that's the carb adaption fat. So just so you know, guys, I mean, there is a bit of a delay in um in how I, I can I can answer these just because they you know they come down. But I do I try to answer all the questions and I certainly uh get to all the super chats as well. Um and I try to answer other questions also, but obviously it's you know it's um uh, I make it a point to to answer all the super chats. So this is about the uh, carb adaption from fat adaption. So you always you're always carb adapted. You're always working on carbohydrates. You always use carbohydrates, and um, you know because you you make carbohydrates when you're in ketosis. Uh, when you start eating carbs again, you really just stop your body from making ketones, and you're still using carbohydrates. And then it just takes a couple of days for you to start. Uh, preloading insulin so that you can effectively keep your blood sugar down, but you're always running on carbs. So you never, you never, you never go off that. Um, so yeah, you're always carb adapted really. Leonardo, thank you for the super chat. Uh, hypothesis ketones, uh, is not a starvation survival function as commonly thought, but a result of abundance dietary or stored fat that gets interrupted when we eat plants thoughts. No, I, I, I agree. I don't think this is a survival function. I think this is our, this is our primary metabolic state. This is the primary metabolic state of essentially well, all, most animals, at least in the wild. So carnivores and herbivores are in a state of ketosis or starvation state, um, because they're always getting meat and fat. They don't, they don't take in a bunch of carbohydrates. So carnivores, because they eat animals with fat, they go for the fat first, they're eating fat and meat, right? So they absorb fat and protein high proportion of fat to protein generally and then uh but also herbivores because they don't you know they're, they're taking in a bunch of fiber which is just all carbs but that's not actually what they absorb because no vertebrate animal can break down uh no vertebrate animal can break down uh, fiber and so it's actually the fiber is there to feed their gut bacteria and the gut bacteria eat that, break down all the fiber. And then as their waste, they secrete short chain fatty acids, which are also hundred percent saturated. So they absorb the fat. They absorb the waste, the sort of weird to think about, but the byproduct of this bacteria, that's what they absorb. And then the bacteria die off and they break those down and absorb those as proteins. So what a cow eats is grass, but what they absorb is fat and protein. What a gorilla eats are green leaves. What they absorb is fat and protein and all the way down, down the line. So, um, yeah, so that, so gorillas and cows are in the same ketogenic so-called starvation state. So it's not a starvation state. The only reason we call it a fasting state is by the time we were able to look at our biochemistry at a molecular level, everyone was eating carbohydrates and it says, okay, what does this look like when we eat? Oh, it looks like this. Great. And okay, what about if we stop eating? Does it look the same? Well, no, actually about 24 hours, it looks this other way. Oh, very interesting. That must be a fasting state that changes. Okay. But if you eat anything else on earth except carbohydrates, it also looks like this so-called fasting state. So they just jumped the gun a bit. You know, they didn't test things out um, as much as they should have. And and this is this is up until current day. And that's what I was taught in biochemistry, you know, two decades ago. And uh, it's wrong right? Because when I eat 5,000 calories in ribeye, I am not fasting. And so whatever my, whatever you can say about my metabolic state, you cannot say it's a fasting state because not fasting, right? So I think that that's our primary metabolic state. That's, and that's the primary metabolic state of, of most animals in the wild, except, you know, little birds and bees and things that, that eat nectar. God knows what their metabolism is like. But uh, for for the other carnivores and herbivores out there, you know, you're running on fat and protein, and so I think that's that's uh, that the what we call a fed state, what we call our primary state, is actually a pathological defense mechanism that your body's defending against high blood sugar because high blood sugar is toxic. It damages. It causes direct damage to your body and kill. This is what kills diabetics: is, is prolonged high blood sugar. Right. So those glucose molecules physically fuse 
to other molecules and they damage them. They cause permanent damage and disruption to your body. And so your body looks at that and goes, sweet Jesus, what's going on here? And you slam up insulin to try to get this out and, and save the, save the, you know, the body. And so that, that's, that's just a, 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 a defense mechanism. That's not our normal state, right? Because if we're eating what we're designed to eat, what we're normally eating, what we were eating during the ice ages, that's not the state we're in. And so you can call it ketosis. You can call it whatever you want. You know, people say that the, the Inuit don't go into ketosis, but that's really because just their ketones are pretty low. Uh, you get better at, at using your ketones as you go. And uh, you get more efficient at it. So at first you have high ketones because your body's not keto adapted and it's not. And so you have, just like if you're insulin resistant, your blood sugar goes up and it's harder for your body to get this into the cells to use. So at first you're ketone resistant, right? Because you don't have the mechanisms set up to use ketones properly because you haven't been using them. You haven't been making them. And, uh, you know, just like when you go back to eating carbs, all of a sudden you're not making enough insulin. You're like, Oh God, okay. Got to get those wheels turning again. And so for ketones, it just takes a bit of time, but it, when you've been on it long enough, your ketones aren't that high. That's because you're using them. You're using them better. And whatever happens, it's supposed to happen, right? Because you're eating what you're supposed to eat. And so whatever happens is supposed to happen. And the, the Inuit, you know, they say, well, they're not in ketosis. I don't know because they're making ketones. They're making blood sugar. They're making glycogen. They're not just running off of the, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's glycogen in meat and organs, but is that enough to run all of their energy demands? Is their insulin chronically elevated? No, I don't think so. So not that I know of anyway. So I think that they are in ketosis. I just think that it looks different when you've been on it your whole life, as opposed to just a six week study. Right. So, um, but yeah, I definitely agree that I, we, the fasting state is not uh, a fasting state that, um, that I think that's our, our primary metabolic state. And that's where all of our heavy machinery come to bear. That's where all the beneficial biochemical actions happen. That's where autophagy comes from. Mitophagy replacing your mitochondria and, and, and bulking up their number. Um, <coughs> Um, you know, all the different benefits you get from, from fasting, all these different, oh, that we know fasting is so good for you. So you go on a carnivore diet, it just mimics fasting. No, no. Fasting mimics the metabol metabolism you're supposed to be in all the time anyway, which you would be in if you were on your proper diet. How can we say that eating a whole bunch of grains and sugar and processed crap is normal for us? None of that existed in, in the last ice age or any ice age or before the 1800s. Why, why are we eating things that didn't exist before, you know, before the 1800s? I mean, there, there are things that we're eating now that didn't exist before we were even born, right? Why the hell are we eating them? You definitely aren't adapted to those things, right? Uh, what are we adapted to? We're adapted to meat. Whatever you're adapted to, that's what you're supposed to eat. That's what, that's a, that's an immutable law of biology is adaptation. You, you get stressors and survival pressures. And whatever can adapt best to that situation survives and thrives. And we not only survived, we not only thrived, we became the most dominant species on earth during ice ages when all we had to eat was meat, right? So we are well adapted to eating meat. We are not well adapted to eating any plants. And, you know, some people have a bit of adaptation, eight to 10,000 years with agriculture. A lot of people don't. A lot of people have not been introduced to agriculture until they were met by the Western colonial powers a few hundred years ago. And many of them still didn't eat any of that garbage. They knew better. It's only in sort of the recent century and a half that they started doing that. The Native Americans were still eating mostly meat until, you know, we wiped out the buffalo in the, the, the American Indian Wars, you know, Buffalo Bill, which I still think is just a an atrocity, just an absolute atrocity. And, um, but that's what it was. And so in the 1800s, the native Americans and plains Indians were the tallest human beings on earth. That's been well studied and documented. And now they are not, they started eating a Western diet. They are more likely to get 
obese and sick and diabetic and metabolic issues and cancer and, and these other sorts of things when eating a Western diet. So what does that mean? That means if, you know, that means the food is causing the disease because if they don't eat the food, they don't get the disease and we eat the food and we get the disease. We just get it at a lower rate because we have had a bit of protection. We've had a bit of adaptation. 10,000 years is not that much, but it does something. And so we have some adaptive measures to protect us where the native Americans don't, the native Australians don't sub-Saharan Africans don't have as much. And so that's, that's uh, where you see a lot of disparities in health come from that background. How long have you been exposed to these nasty plants that we really shouldn't be eating? If you've been exposed to them longer, you can do better with them. If you have not had much exposure to them, you know, uh, genetically in your, in your, uh, genetic past, then you're not as adapted to it. The law of nature, the law of biology is adaptation. And if you have not had time to adapt, you should not be eating or exposing yourself to that thing. You want to expose yourself to things that you are well adapted to. And what we are well adapted to all humans is meat. And so that's what you should eat. Lee Martinez. Uh, thank you very much for, or maybe Leah Martinez. Thank you very much for the super chat. I asked this question already, but wanted to send a super chat. Oh, well, thank you. 66 year old, all blood work is great except for, uh, protein and TIBC, which are both low carnivore six TIBC. TI blood counts. I'm not, not recognizing that one. Maybe that's something else. Maybe put in the, in the, in the chat. Um, what that stands for either way, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. So sometimes you have like little aberrant blood tests, but you know, again, this is, this is what we're designed to eat. And so as long as you're only eating fatty meat and you're getting enough of it and you don't have any sort of other medical issues, then, um, well, really it doesn't really matter what your medical issues are. If you're eating what you're supposed to eat, they're going to work better, but you can have other medical issues that have nothing to do with the, the food that you're eating. Um, so, um, yeah, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about, um, about the protein and things like that. Just keep eating and you're, you'll sort it out as long as you're feeling well, that's the important thing. You know, you treat patients, you don't treat blood tests. You know, if you're feeling well and there's no issue, then you just keep an eye on it and, uh, and then you, you can check it again and, um, and see what's going on with it. And if you're getting symptomatic with something and then you check your blood and something's off, then you start thinking, okay, well, what, what could this mean? What could this be doing? But if you just have an aberrant blood test, that's not necessarily an issue. And uh, as long as you're feeling well and you're doing well, so I, I wouldn't worry too much and everything else is fine. So, you know, yeah, I would, uh, yeah, I would just keep going as you are and uh, just put a pin in that. And if you check your bloods again, you know, take a look, see what's going on. It could be perfectly normal for you. People sit in different ranges normally. And so if that's normal for you, then that's great. Um, basics asks, hey, Anthony, uh, love what you do. Well, thank you very much. Uh, when are you going to make a documentary in the same style as a Game Changers? Well, I'm, yeah, I don't know. I was thinking about it actually, but, um, you know, I, I just, God, I just don't know when the hell I would do it. Um but people like Carrie Mann from Homestead Howe just jumped right on that train because he saw how much of a massive benefit this made for him. And he started talking to a lot of people who was massively helping. He's just like, no, we need to get a documentary out. We need to get this on Netflix. We need to do something big. And, uh, and so he's working on that. So he's working on a carnivore documentary. And so I've, I've uh, well, tried to help out with that as much as I can and uh, put him in touch with different people that can help with that. And, uh, and I'll be presumably, um, in it as well. And, and talking to him or and talking about all this sort of stuff in that documentary. And so hopefully that, that gets out now. Um, Brian Sanders has been doing this for six years now. So he's, he's, um, you know, the, the, um, creator of food lies and the, you know, created that. So he's, he's making this documentary about food lies and, and now not necessarily carnivore, but but n the vilification about meat is dead ass wrong and showing that this is wrong. And actually eating animal based is very appropriate is more appropriate. 
So it's not a carnivore do uh, documentary per se, but it's pretty damn close. And it really goes exactly the opposite of where every other documentary says, oh my God, less meat, less meat, less meat, less meat. Oh, it's just, just meat just causing disease or just stop eating it and you'll get better. Eat any ass plant that you want. It doesn't matter. It's hemlock, whatever. Just eat it. Just, just plants because that's what they say. More, more fruits and vegetables, less meat, you do better. Okay. Well, which ones, you know, they are different, you know, and most plants on earth are inedible. So you can't just tell people just to eat any random plant and it'll be good. And any meat will be bad. That's ridiculous. That is just ridiculous. Again, going back to adaptation and these immutable laws of biology. Anyone who studies biology should damn well know this. Life is about adaptation. And if you've not been adapting to something, you're not designed for it. If you have been adapting to it for millions of years, then you are adapted to it and it is beneficial and it is good for you. And, um, you know, people like Simon Hill will say, well, just because we're adapted to it, we've been eating it for millions of years, doesn't mean it's actually good for us. Okay. You name one example anywhere on earth that that's true anywhere, you know, lions have been eating meat for millions of years, but yeah, but, but a fresh spring salad is going to be better for them. Really? Okay. Prove it. Right. So why would it be different for humans and no other animal on earth? Why would the laws of adaptation only apply to other animals and not humans? That is ridiculous. That is a ridiculous statement. So you have a lot of these ridiculous statements. And then you have the Maasai and the Akikuyu, who then people will say, well, but the Akikuyu, yes, they're not doing as well. They're much less healthy, um, but they, you know, they, they, that's not the vegan diet I would recommend or the vegetarian diet because they do eat some meat and dairy, very little. That's not the vegetarian diet I would recommend. Okay, so they're doing they're doing vegetarianism wrong. That's always the classic excuse. You're just doing vegetarianism wrong. Well, your studies say that more fruits and vegetables and less meat equal better. But there's an entire population with three quarters of a million people in the Akikuyu who in 1931 were eating a clean, non-processed food diet, plant-based. And the Maasai who were eating a clean, non-processed food, animal-based diet. And the Maasai were far and away more healthy, better developed, five inches taller, bigger brains, more uh, uh, more body, lean body mass, and stronger and healthier, had less health defects, right? And birth de and um, um, uh, developmental defects, right? Well, that's but that's not the vegetarian diet I would recommend. Okay, you said less meat, better. These guys have more meat; they're doing better. These guys are having more plants, less meat. They're doing worse. So your studies are crap. If a study disagrees with reality, it's wrong, period. It doesn't matter, right? So even, even like mathematical equations, you know, uh, Richard Feynman said, physicist, he said, it doesn't matter how brilliant your th theory is and it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. And so you write this mathematical proof and Einstein was known to do this. And you write this mathematical proof, say, I proved this. Great. And everyone's like, my God, you're a genius. And then they go and observe things and go like, yep, that's not what's happening. Throw it out. And Einstein would throw it out because he was smart enough to know that it didn't matter what he thought he proved in a mathematical proof. He just looked at it and said, yeah, that's not what's happening. Okay. Obviously, there's something here going on that I don't know. I don't have all the variables. And so he tossed it out. And that's what you have to do. And so, oh, but there's this study and it said, I don't care. First of all, the majority of studies come from uh, food, the food and drug industry. Why would you listen to any of those? Uh, you know, the Coca-Cola, just Coca-Cola, not Kellogg's, Pepsi, Nestle, General Mills, all the rest of them. Just Coca-Cola spends 11 times the amount of money on nutritional research every year than the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, right? The vast majority of, of these studies are put out by the, the companies trying to sell you this shit, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, heroin cartels are going to put out as many studies as they can to tell you how great heroin is, right? Why would you trust that? You know, it's the same thing. These are cartels. These are drug cartels. They are making you sick. They are making you addicted and they are profiting. This is, this is the opium trade. This is the new opium trade where people are making entire empires based on 
your addiction and your sickness. Do not listen to these people. And now they're and then they're putting out studies saying how great opium is. I bet they are, right? Why would you listen to that? Why would you listen to this crap? It doesn't agree with reality, right? So, well, more plants, less less meat, that's better because meat causes harm. That's their contention. But you have the Maasai, more meat, more dairy, drinking blood, barely any plants, and they're the healthiest people in that region, right? And they interbreed, they intermarry, right? So they're genetically similar, right? And you have three quarters of a million Akikuyu at the time, mostly plant-based, clean, no processed food, no pesticides, no fertilizers, anything like that, not doing very well. And it wasn't, and, and, and they supplemented them, gave them, uh, you know, nutritional supplements because they're all deficient, got them up to, up to snuff, didn't help, didn't help their health issues. It wasn't until they replaced the plants they were eating with meat. That's when they improved. Okay. So again, it doesn't meet with reality. It's wrong. Okay. And, um, and so people like Brian Sanders are making documentaries showing all the lies and how wrong this stuff is. So that's coming out. Hopefully that'll be done this year. He's put a lot of work into that and I'm really excited to see that. Um, I have a, a bit of a cameo in it. If they decide to keep uh, some of my my things I've said in there, uh, which would be great. But uh, but it's massive. It's massive. That means they've been putting this together for six years. So I'm really excited for that. So that'll be. Uh, so people don't know Brian Sanders. Uh, just look him up on on Instagram. Um, he has uh, a YouTube channel and podcast as well. Uh, it's all run out of like his uh, Instagram pages. Um, Food lies. And I think it's the website like foodlies.com or something like that, but certainly on Instagram. And so that's Brian's um, Instagram. And you can you can find all the YouTube channel and podcast stuff through that as well. And I've been on his podcast and he's been on mine. So really nice guy. And um, and he, I'm really looking forward to that documentary. And then I'm really looking forward to Carrie, uh, Carrie Mann's documentary as well. Because that, that one is specifically carnivore, like carnivore helps people. And they're going to be following people and tracking people. As they go, they're like, okay, I'm going to get started on carnivore, and and they're doing before, middle, and after, and seeing how this affects people in real time, which I think is really, really powerful. One of the one of the most gripping and powerful food documentaries, which really started the genre, was uh, it's called Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. As people were, this guy was very sick, unwell. He's taking all these medications. He had. I think he had some autoimmune issues and he basically went to a, just a clean non-processed food diet and was juicing vegetables, but he was still eating meat, but he was just sort of juicing things and stuff like that. And you could see him, he was just losing weight and skin getting better. And like throughout the documentary, he was going around talking to people and he was just looking healthier and healthier and healthier as he went. And he's always drinking this green smoothie. So that was influenced by the, by the vegan uh, community, like Dr. Uh, Joel Furman, if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure it's Joel Furman. And, um, and uh, so that had that sort of bent, but it was very, it was very powerful. Now this was only him; it was only his progress. Um, whereas in the carnivore diet, we're going to be showing all sorts of people, or Carrie's going to be showing all sorts of people, not just one person getting better, and and really talking about the science behind it and things like that. So hopefully, it has has a similar impact. And um, yeah, so so exciting times. So um, I don't know, maybe I'll do one. I am working on a book. I'm hoping to get it out at the end of the year. I'm, I'm sort of getting more on on top of that. And um, uh, yeah, so we'll see. We'll see if, uh, if I can get that out by the end of the year or early next year. And and um, and then yeah, we have these cool documentaries coming out on in the pipeline as well. So that's exciting. Juju Berry, thank you very much for the super chat. Question, eight weeks on carnivore. When I weight train, I cannot sleep at night. Any thoughts? 24 male eating two big ribeyes and one pound of ground beef. Well, you can play around with what, what times you, you train and work out. Sometimes when people work out, it just sort of lights them up and, they, and then they you know wake themselves up. And so if you're working out late at night, that might be a problem. I have I have that problem sometimes. And sometimes if I would eat meat and I wouldn't eat as much as my body wants, it'll just sort of pick me up and my body's like, yep, that's enough to get us going for a bit. Now go kill something else, right? Here's energy, go kill something. And, um, 
you know, food, not, not people, but, um, you know, and so, so I've noticed that as well. So just play around with, with how much you're eating and when you're eating and when you're working out. So normally if you're eating a big fatty meal at night and you eat until it stops tasting good until you're really full and your body says, no, that's enough. Normally people get very lethargic and tired and sleep very well after that. I certainly do. Some people don't. So people need to eat earlier on. Okay, fine. Just listen to your body and, just, and play around with it. And also play around with what time of day you're working out. If it's if if you're working out at night and that's waking you up, okay, you need to try and work out a bit earlier than that. And uh, but you should be able to um, should be able to find something that works for you. And um, and hopefully you do. Do you know, two big ribeyes and a ground and pound of ground beef? That sounds like a lot, but is that enough for you? Keep eating until fatty meat stops tasting good. Try to have leftovers, right? Because if you're finishing everything on your plate and you're like, yeah, that was good. Well, you know, you probably need more and you should cook more and, and keep going until you're like, Ugh, I really don't want to eat anymore. And so you have a bit left on your plate. That's fine. Eat it tomorrow. It's totally fine. So anyway, good luck. <clears throat> Okay, uh, thank you very much, Les Kaiser, for a super chat. The Buckeye State says, hey, well, hello. When I told my doctor I was starting carnivore, he was happy. Hey, that's a, that's, that's a pleasant surprise. Uh, it's happening more and more, which is great. He wants to use me for a guinea pig, um, as he has had many patients ask him about doing this diet, but uh, double my statins, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. Um, well, look. You got, you can, you, well, this is, this is your decision and taking any medication is, is always the patient's decision. Um, you know, and if, and, and you can have a conversation with your doctor, you say, Hey, look, you know, I don't, you know, this is, I'm thinking that maybe I don't want to take this for, for these reasons, or maybe you're happy to, and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, it is it's perfectly fine to have a conversation and just, and just, um, you know, relay any misgivings that you may have. One thing to remember with statins is that, um, is that how how they re lower LDL cholesterol is they they don't get rid of like the small dense so there's over a hundred different particles of LDL right and so or or different types and so the ones that we we probably don't want around are the small dense LDL okay so SD LDL that's a pattern B in your in your LDL cholesterol. So do statins reduce those? No, they do not. How statins work, how they lower your total LDL cholesterol, and again, there's over 100 different kinds, it stops your body from making the large, buoyant LDL that you want. Those are the ones that you want, okay? And so that I can actually lower the ones that you want, and then you have a disproportionately high ones if you don't want, like the SDLDL. So... According to the, uh, now people can watch my interview with uh, Dr. Asima Hotra, who's an interventional cardiologist from the UK. He wrote a whole book called A Statin-Free Life. And uh, so people can watch that on my YouTube channel and uh, and get the lowdown on statins and and uh, cholesterol. How I met him was we did a um, a, a debate on on cholesterol and, you know, did have we got this right, that, that cholesterol is actually a driving factor for heart disease? And we argued, no, that it wasn't. And, uh, and we, we won that. We won that debate against sort of three other cardiologists and professors of medicine and things like that. I was the only non-cardiologist there, um, which was funny, but it's something that, you know, I've looked into. And, um, you know, so there's, uh, there is information out there showing that LDL and cholesterol in general was really never a marker for heart disease in the first place. And, you know, we're, we're lowering it in our diet. We're lowering it not with drugs and heart disease rates are going up. Right. And we will say, uh, you know, dishonest people will try to mislead you and say, well, you know, deaths related to cardiovascular disease peaked in the sixties and seventies. And now have been coming down steadily since, well, that's because our interventions have been getting better and we've stopped smoking as much, right? The rate of heart disease is going up. The prevalence, the incidence, of heart disease is going up it's much higher than it was in the in the 60s and 70s much higher as a proportion of society and as a percentage of people getting it each year and first time heart attacks people having their first heart attack there are more people getting first time heart attacks they're just surviving right so it's very dishonest 
to try and, and switch the goalposts and, and say, well, hey, the rates of heart disease is going up. Well, actually, death from heart disease has, has gone down. Not what I just said. I said the rate of heart disease, didn't I? So when someone switches like that and they and they use weasel words and try to change the direction of what we're talking about, you know they're dishonest. And so if you ever catch anyone doing that, call them out on it immediately because they are they're a fraud and they're trying to con you and don't let them. So um, your doctor's probably not going to do that. The doctor sounds like a, a very good guy and that is interested in this, but you know, just that's how people think about statins, but just that's, that's what statins do. They lower your, your large buoyant LDL molecules that stops your body from making those it also stops it making in your brain, Lipitor, atorvastatin, um, and, and other statins. Some of them will cross the blood brain barrier, Lipitor, and Ator which is atorvastatin. Um, unless I'm completely blank, but I'm pretty sure it is that crosses your blood brain barrier, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, and that can stop your brain from making cholesterol and a big proportion of your brain is cholesterol, right? You need it for myelination of your axons and things like that. So that's not good. So that's not actually what you want. And so just remember that and remember that the, the, from the, the studies published by the drug company. So this is, this is as pretty a picture as it's ever going to be for statins show that if you've had a heart attack and you go on statins for at least five years, you will on average increase your life expectancy by five days, days, right? For years, at least five years or more, 20 plus years, whatever of taking these things. If you've had a heart attack, if you have not had a heart attack, it does not increase life expectancy. So what are we doing here? And there was a study with over 11 million patients and they found that higher LDL cholesterol of any particulate size. They didn't even look at distinguish the particulates. They just said LDL period. People with higher LDL cholesterol, 11 million people, big study. Higher the LDL, the lower their all-cause mortality, meaning they lived longer. So people with higher LDL cholesterol lived the longest. Okay? So, you know, just think about that. And you can watch my, my video just called The Truth About Cholesterol and Heart Disease. Where I talk about how this is really just this has been a scapegoat and it's it's not the cause of heart disease and and there's a lot of evidence for that and um, in fact just the best evidence is that the cholesterol uh, being the cholesterol model and theory of heart disease in the first place was uh, put out by by the sugar companies and uh, they paid off a number of different professors um, three from Harvard at least uh, Ansel Keys famously who came up with that model and they were on the payroll for the sugar companies and they did not tell anybody and that's illegal and one of those harvard professors was named head of the usda and he was the one who authored and published the 1977 declaration saying that cholesterol causes heart disease stop eating it stop eating saturated fat and that's and that's what changed everything it was hotly debated for decades before that and then that shut down the argument so and that was false that was fraud that was, they were bought and paid for. And we have documentation of that. That was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2016. Okay. That's a matter of historical record. That happened. We have clear documentation. We even have their, their, um, their contracts. We know how much they got paid. These guys got paid $6,500 back in the 60s. That's the equivalent of $55,000 now. So selling out your health and your parents' health and having your parents and grandparents die early and then die of dementia. Uh, was, you know, they, they got a new Camry for that. That's, that's what, that's what the health of your family and your children was worth to them. It's sick. And, um, and I, you know, it's, it's just sad that these people have all passed away so that we can't execute them for their crimes against humanity, because truly those are crimes against humanity. The hundreds of millions, billions of people that they've affected and damaged and killed prematurely because of that terrible, terrible lie that they made is, is staggering. I mean, I don't think we'll ever be able to calculate the amount of, of harm that this has caused. But I mean, you're, you're talking about billions of people that have been serious. I mean, all the kids that have been raised on a low fat diet with a bunch of processed foods. None of them have developed properly. All the developmental issues, developmental delays, shorter stature, um, smaller, you know, uh, shrinking IQs, things like that. That is all directly related to eating the wrong thing and not getting enough fat and cholesterol for our brains to develop properly and eating a whole bunch of things that 
that screw with our lives. And now the drug companies are complicit with it now and saying, oh, everyone over 40 should be on a statin purely because you're over 40. Get bent. Like I have absolutely no interest in anything that these people have to say. Um, so I love that your doctor is, is, uh, interested in this. Um, you know, watch that video that I did, the truth about the carnival or the truth about cholesterol and heart disease. Watch the interview I do with Dr. Asim Ahotra. Watch the one I do with, uh, Dr. Paul Mason. That's, that will, that's really interesting. That's, that's one of my favorite ones. Um, that will tell you a lot about cholesterol and statins, and then you can make an informed decision and, uh, and have a discussion, an informed discussion with your doctor. And it sounds like he's a, he's a reasonable guy and uh, will we'll likely have a very reasonable and reasoned um, conversation with you. So, uh, yeah, so just, just give it a shot. But, yeah, that's awesome and uh, sounds good. So keep it up. Joseph, thank you very much for the super chat. Question. Uh, 33 uh, healthy male with Asperger's carnivore high fat help uh, fasting helps greatly. Well, that's great to hear suggestions to improve being on the spectrum that aren't gimmicks. I've seen esters, MCT oil, uh, sulforaphane, uh, Epicor, etc. Well, I'd say the hell away from uh, sulforaphane. Um, that's, that's something that's so toxic that the plant doesn't even keep it in its full form, just like, you know, with cyanide, they keep, keep it separate and then you start chewing it and releases these chemicals, which then bind to form hydrogen cyanide, which is deadly to all life. Um, and then sulforaphane is the same, uh, same sort of mechanism where you, you chew up things like it's in broccoli and other sorts of things. You chew it up and then releases these chemicals, which then bind and combine to, to make sulforaphane. Uh, so that's so toxic that even the plant doesn't want to get near it. It's just, it's just a kill switch. You're going to kill me. I'm going to take you out with me right? You start chewing me, I'm going to release this toxic poison that's going to get you, right? So I, you know, maybe in, in low doses, whatever, maybe it helps because, you know, what is medicine? It's just a poison that that in certain doses at certain times gives more benefit than harm. But if you don't have that, if you're not in that moment and at that dose, it only causes harm or it just doesn't do anything, anything beneficial anyway. So, uh, you know, until we have some, you know, trials, you know, uh, some, some, some phase three trials going out there showing that certain dose of sulforaphane helps in this, uh, for Asperger's, I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it, but, uh, that's just me. Um, no, the, the main thing is, is being on a proper human diet, having things that are, that are beneficial to your brain, like meat and fat in particular, animal fat omega-3 fatty acids, which you can get from, from beef. But if it's grain finished for too long, intensively grain finished, it will have much less omega-3. So, you know, have a, have a tin of sardines and, you know, in it, in water, don't have it in like sunflower oil or any sort of seed oil or anything like that. Miserable, uh, oils like that. Um, just in water without herbs or anything like that, just get them plain, plain, plain. And, um, you know, maybe some, cod liver and in its own oil and things like that. Uh, those sorts of things. Uh, those are going to have great, great amounts of omega threes or, you know, just have salmon or fish or whatever once a week, something like that. Um, that is going to give you the things that you need to, to grow and maintain your brain and then specifically avoiding things that are going to curtail it. So, uh, being in ketosis, not having any, any carbohydrates, right? Whether you're in or out of ketosis is not really the issue. It's just staying away from carbohydrates because there are, I mean, there, there are papers out that argue, say, you know, uh, there, there's one, I believe it's called, um, uh, ketosis as a treatment for autism. And it just goes through all the evidence as to why this is, this is probably a good idea. And their entire treatment, uh, facilities for people with, with, uh, uh, autism and Asperger's who, uh, you know, which is on the spectrum for autism uh, who are having great success with ketogenic diets in general. And I think carnivore is the best ketogenic diet. So just, just keep it carnivore, high fat, red meat, have some omega, you know, fish and get for the omega threes once or twice a week, you know, sardines are great. You know, the bigger carnivorous fish, they, they'll sort of 
get more of a load of heavy metals. And so the smaller fish that sort of don't eat a lot of other fish, they don't have as much of a buildup of these heavy metals. That can be a problem. So, uh, you know, that's why sardines are, you know, probably a good option there too. But yeah, so getting those omega threes, getting those things that are good for your brain and your body, and then just avoiding all the things that are going to screw it up, like carbohydrates, which will raise your insulin, which will drop your ketones. And ketones are the most important fuel for your brain. And so you start running on glucose and your brain will not run as well. So those aren't gimmicks. Those have been shown in, in studies uh, to be effective. Um, MCT oil, maybe. Esters, maybe. I don't, I don't know of any evidence for that, but you can play with it. But I think that if you are eating just high-fat carnivore diet, you're going to get all of that that you need. Your ketones are going to be up. Uh, you're going to have a lot of healthy fats and uh, cholesterol around to, to build and maintain and run your brain. And uh, that's what you need. So, and you'll get all the things that you need too, because some some um, forms of autism can be just from nutritional deficiencies. Like there's one at Texas A&M showed that you get this from uh, uh, carnitine deficiency. Only 70% of people say, oh, that's a, that's a non-essential amino acid. Only for about 70% of people. The other 30% don't make enough or, or any at all. And so they have to get it from their diet and it only comes from meat. So you're doing the things that you need to do. You're eating the things that your body needs and your brain needs, and then you're eliminating out all the things that could potentially cause harm. And so that's great. So just fatty red meat and water, grain finished, or sorry, grass fed and finished if you can, because that has a better complement of omega-3s, maybe sardines once or twice a week, and don't eat anything else. Certainly no seed oils, certainly no plant oils, certainly no sugar, certainly no carbs. And I, I think you'll do great and you just keep going as you are and uh, you'll just keep getting better and better. So good luck with that. P. Anderson, thank you very much for the super chat. 53-year-old female, feel amazing and thriving on carnivore, five months strong. Grateful for all you do and share thoughts on labs. Uh, April to September's number, total cholesterol, 163 uh, to 212, HDL 46 to 56, triglycerides 136 to 87, LDL 94 to 137, glucose 99 to 106. Uh, that all looks fine. I mean, the glucose, I mean, was that a fasting glucose, non-fasting glucose? What time of day was it? Um, you can have different sorts of variability because of that. It's really important to get your bloods tested in the same way, in the same fashion, uh, every, every time you do it, all your bloods. So first thing in the morning, fasted from the night before 9 PM. So you want first thing in the morning between eight, and 9 AM fasted from 9 PM the, the night before at least same hydration status. So two to four glasses of water in the morning, no less, no more, um, sedentary, sedate, calm. Don't get road rage on the way to, uh, get your blood test done and, uh, no, exercise, physical, strenuous physical activity or sexual activity the morning of or the day before. And don't take any meds the, the morning of to wait for after. Um, you have to do that in that same way. And if you do that in that same way, you'll get more consistent results. And it makes a big difference, especially for things like glucose, as well as cholesterol. So I wouldn't worry too much about the glucose. I mean, you know, a better thing is, is looking at your fasting insulin and your HbA1c, because that tells you what your blood sugar and insulin have been doing for months, right? Um, it's going to be fine. It's going to be better. And, um, but your cholesterol looks great. So, you know, total cholesterol is a meaningless number. Total LDL is a meaningless number, except in so far as it'll, you know, it, uh, uh, means that you're probably going to live longer. Right. Um, but it doesn't tell us what kind of LDL that you have pattern A or pattern B, but if your HDL is going up, which it is, if your triglycerides are going down, which they are, then that sh that indicates that you likely have pattern A, more of the large point LDL cholesterol molecules that you want and not the small, dense, damaged ones that you don't want. And so those LDL cholesterol, that LDL that of 137 that you have, those are good. Those are good LDL that are, are ben benefiting you. <laughs> And so I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Also remember that if you just stop eating carbohydrates in general, even if you don't change anything else, your LDL will go up. If you just stop eating all food entirely, your LDL will go up. Why is that? Fasting raises LDL. Okay. So is it 
the high fat carnivore diet that you're eating that's making your LDL go up? It's making your HDL go up, but is it making your LDL go up? Well, it's the same as, as if you're just fasting, your LDL will go up if you were fasting. So is it the fact that you're eating a high fat carnivore diet or is it the fact that you're not eating carbohydrates? Is that what's rating, raising your LDL? I would, I would bet that it's the latter. And then not eating carbohydrates and sugar and alcohol and seed oils is bringing your triglycerides right down. So that's how you can, that's how I would interpret those bloods as well. Um, obviously that's just a snapshot and we don't know much else. And I don't know anything about your, your medical history, but when I look generally at cholesterol, you know, that's, those are the sort of, of my thoughts there. So let's see, there we go. Um, Molly Malone, uh, thank you very much for the super chat. There's no question there, but maybe there's one down. I'll take a look. Um, not seeing one. Oh, here we go. So Molly Malone, uh, thank you for the super chat. Question, 70 year old female, no meds. Um, 132 pounds, no weight loss, 78 days, strict carnivore hair falling out at alarming rate since day five, everything else is great. So, well, 135, 32 pounds. I, I don't know how tall you are or how much, you know, excess fat that you have to lose if you have any to lose. Um, but potentially, um, are you eating enough? Are you eating enough fat? Normally, if you're having problems with your hair or problems with your skin or problems with your nails, it's usually people aren't eating enough and, and specifically not eating enough fat. So you need to eat fatty meat, a lot more fat than you've ever thought imaginable um, because it's a lot more fat than when we've been, a lot more fat than we were told was ever safe. Um, and so you need a lot more than you think. And so just make sure you're eating enough. Make sure you're eating enough fat. Keep eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good. And uh, quite often that will actually trigger weight loss because if you're chronically under eating, you are, you are repressing your, your metabolism and your body saying, Hey, look, we're in a famine. We need to store all of this. We can't give up any of this stuff. Right. Whereas when you are steadily eating enough, your body goes, Oh, Hey, we're not in a famine anymore. Great. Now we don't need all this extra stuff. Let's start using it and start building and repairing. Right. <laughs> So that can happen as well. And um, also we can have from, uh, you know, just years of eating the wrong thing and restricting diets and things like that. We can get leptin resistance and other sort of hormonal issues. Um, so that can take a long time to sort of repair. And, and you know, when we're uh, 70, you know, it's, it's you've had a lot of decades of harm from eating the wrong things. And sometimes they don't repair all the way. So you can check your thyroid, you can check your leptin, you can check these, these sorts of things and see if that may be part of the problem that you're having with uh, not losing weight. Also, uh, hair loss can be from thyroid issues. So you can, you can check all that. Now, a carnivore diet won't cause thyroid issues, but you can have like an underlying thyroid issue that you didn't know about before. Generally, it will help that and improve that. Also, something to, to, to know about with hair loss is that it's not necessarily permanent hair loss because you can actually trigger a fallout phase. So you have growth phase, stationary phase, and then fallout phase, and then regrowth, right? So it, it grows back again. So the hair falls out and then it grows a new, new, uh, new hair out of the follicle. So that can happen. That can sort of trigger, you know, any sort of major change in your diet or, or stress levels, all these sorts of things can trigger a fallout phase. Um, but in general, this, these grow back better. And so in women, it's, it's a bit, upsetting and unnerving because your hair is longer. And so it takes a lot longer before you realize, okay, no, it is growing back in. Okay. Right. Because it, it may take years really, you know, to grow long hair. So it can look, it can look very different, but generally people get uh, thicker hair as a result. And so, but if you're, if you're feeling that your hair is not as healthy as it should be, or your nails are not as healthy, it's thick and strong and hard to cut um, like they should be, then eat more, eat more fat in particular. You need the fat, you need the protein, you need enough fatty meat, uh, for proper health. But you know, that, that is something that people can see. They can, they can trigger a bit of a fallout phase, keep eating, make sure your thyroid's in check and all these sorts of things. And, um, and that should come back.
and should be shouldn't be a problem. So just keep going with that. Uh, I think you'll be fine just as long as you're eating enough. Make sure you're eating enough. Make sure you're eating enough fatty meat, and um, I think you should be fine. Uh, just Mary Blanchard says, "Can I can I use um, apple cider vinegar or just use salt and water?" I I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't use apple cider vinegar. I just I don't know what the sort of a reference to, but I would just, I just sort of saw that. And, uh, I would avoid apple cider vinegar. I would just avoid any, any plant-based anything. They may have some sort of benefits. They're going to have other detriments, you know? And, and so is that really what you want to put in your body? You don't need any of these things. You just need meat. Was apple cider vinegar around in the last ice age? Probably don't need it then. So, uh, that would be my, my offhand sort of remark to that. Uh, mindfulness naturopath. Thank you very much for the, for the super chat. Thank you for encouraging me to get into uh, carnivore lost 40 pounds in the last few months and reverse my PCOS. Awesome. That's great to hear. Uh, well, very well done. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing with PCOS is it's, um, it's, uh, largely driven by insulin resistance, you know, and you're having high insulin levels, high insulin can actually promote the, the generation of, of more testosterone in the ovaries and block its conversion into estrogen. So you end up getting too much testosterone, not enough estrogen, and people can have very serious issues with polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is, which is the leading cause of infertility in, in women. And so that's a very big issue. So, and it's, and it comes down to insulin resistance. This is the funny thing. You know, when, when you go to fertility clinics and they go like, Hey, yeah, you have PCOS here, go on metformin. It'll lower your insulin resistance and you'll get pregnant in no time. Like, why are we not seeing that connection with PCOS and metabolic disorder, right? And why are we not seeing, well, we can reverse type 2 diabetes by putting people on a ketogenic diet. Why can't we, and which is, you know, the hallmark of type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. Insulin resistance causes uh, PCOS. Why wouldn't we connect those dots or, you know, some of us, why don't they connect some of those dots and 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 realize that you you can you can reverse PCOS by by getting rid of these uh, carbohydrates and things like that and eating a proper diet as well. So that's great. I'm glad that you you uh, tried it out and um, you know took the risk, got the reward. So that's great. You know, like Jordan Peterson says, you know, you have to go out and you have to face dragons, and dragons are scary because they can kill you, but dragons also have treasure. And so if you don't face that risk, you don't, you don't get the reward, right? And so you took the risk, you went against 50 years of the medical and government establishment saying, my God, don't do that. You did it and you, you got the reward. So well done. Lying eyes. Thank you very much for the super chat. Can you reinforce the importance of going completely carnivore and the reasons not giving up sweeteners or fruit interfere with your improvements. Um, well, look, I, I just think it just comes down fundamentally to what we're biologically designed to eat. You know, as I've mentioned before, so you know what you're designed to eat, what we've adapted to eat, uh, is is what's going to be optimal for us. And so, if you're if you're taking in anything that didn't even exist a hundred years ago, like artificial sweeteners. You know, why are we, why are we doing that? Why are we entertaining that now? You know, fruit, so fruit, we can go into the specifics, but you now all fruit is not made equal. Most fruit on earth will still kill you. You know, the cassowary bird eats 150 different kinds of fruit. Every single one will kill you, right? Because they evolved with the cassowary bird and it can own that seed can only germinate if it goes through the digestion of a cassowary bird. So if cassowary birds leave an area, those plants die out. And if something else starts eating those fruit and the cassowary bird's not eating it, they die out. So it has to be very attractive to the cassowary bird. It has to be very, very off-putting or deadly to anything else trying to eat it or else they die, right? They die out. And so, you know, they have to protect, they have to protect their own. So uh, then there are other fruits and things like that, that we do better with, especially the sweeter ones, but we, we've engineered these things to have way too much sugar. And that sugar can be a problem and it's less of a problem than eating, you know, refined separated sugar because there are things that are beneficial and, you know, vitamin C can offset, you know, some of the, the, the problems with, um, and different vitamins can offset the problems with fructose, um, fiber can reduce the absorption by about 30% of fructose. So, you know, you'll get less of it, but there's, you know, you, you eat enough and it's going to be a problem. 
And, um, you know, when were we eating this stuff traditionally? We were eating this stuff uh, never during the Ice Age. And outside of the Ice Age or in places that didn't have ice covering it, you know, 365 days a year, uh, we had access to some of these things, which weren't all that sweet, mostly pretty tart and bitter or, 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 or tart, I should say. Um, and uh, bitter, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need it because that's telling you something's bad in there. Um, and, but not sweet anyway. And it was, it was available, you know, a few weeks out of the year and, uh, and that's it, you know, and we didn't have it every day. We didn't have access to it all day, every day. Uh, not for millions of years anyway, you know, maybe during certain periods around the equator um, for some people, but other people that were in the northern and southern latitudes during the ice ages, no. So we certainly don't need it. And even, even the sweet fruits do have defense chemicals. They just have less, right? And so, but there are furanicumarins in all citrus that react with the sun and cause damage to your body. They bind irreversibly to proteins and DNA and they damage them. You get that on your skin and the sun hits it. You will get chemical burns on your body, right? So there are defense chemicals in there. They're just, there's just maybe less of them. They're not going to kill you sort of things. It's, it's safe. It's not going to kill you that day. So you can get a hit of energy, but it's not perfect energy. It's not all the nutrients you need. It's not necessary. We know that because there are people surviving these ice ages in, in the extreme north and south did not have access to fruits for tens of thousands of years. Okay. So we don't need it. Right. And so if it's not ideal, it's not necessary, it's not optimal. And so adding in a bit of fruits and things like that. Okay. If you want to, and if you do okay with it, go for it. But you're eating carbohydrates, you're going to derail your, your metabolism. Your insulin goes up and it's going to take you out of our primary metabolic state. You're not going to be able to, to make blood sugar and glycogen and ketones, and you're not going to feel as good. You're going to sort of feel good for a bit because you have a bit of a sugar rush and then your insulin stays up and your blood sugar goes down and you can't push out ketones and you feel worse. So I feel a lot better without any of that. A lot better. You know, I drink a glass of milk and I feel fine for a minute. And then I'm like, Oh my God, I'm tired because same thing. I get reactive hypoglycemia and my body is, is, is suppressed the ketones, right? So I don't think it's great uh, to do. I don't think it's optimal. I do know a lot of people that are doing, you know, having some fruit, uh, you know, with carnivore and they do a lot better than they were doing before, but then they drop the fruit and they're like, wow, I'm doing even better still. And so that's great. And so if you want to add in a bit of fruit and you do fine with it, go for it. But I just, I just recommend people try it, you know, try going off and just try having just meat and see how you feel. And if you feel better, great. And if you don't fine, you know, but just, just try that yourself. I feel a lot better without it. And so, you know, I mean, my main thing is just, to, is just like Brian Sanders, just like meat has been unfairly vilified and that's bullshit. And plants are actually toxic by nature. So we should really think about this a bit better. But if people want to eat any of that stuff, that's totally fine. So just do some self-experimentation. Um, try it, you know, both with and without and uh, and see how you feel and, and see what you want to do. That's, that's, um, that's what people should do. Laughing gas, thank you very much for the super chat. 100 grand, sweet. Uh, hey, Doc, <laughs> obviously not. <laughs> um, uh, hey, Doc, is your physique achievable on a carnivore diet and general exercise, or did you have a specific routine and program? What would you recommend for someone who wants similar results in physique? So, so this is what I look like out of shape. So I'm, I, I don't, I've been back in the gym sort of the past two weeks, um, but literally two weeks. And, and before that, I haven't been really going all that often, uh, just, just due to time and just, uh, I've been out of, you know, out of the routine. Um, so the diet can maintain your physique and, and a low body fat and, uh, and musculature, whatever you've done. But yeah, I've, I've spent years in the gym working out and things like that. I just, I work out. I try to work out like lift weights and things like that. I would always try to lift weights four days a week. And then I'd have rugby practice on top of that and, and other sort of sprint training, plyometric trainings and things like that independently. So I was working out a lot and I, you know, built up a lot of musculature and, um, you know, when I was just back on carnivore, I was, you know, I was, I've always been sort of muscular because I've always sort of 
worked out a lot, but now I really hit into it and was, because I had a home gym and I, I had time on my hands. So I would, I would lift weights for three to four hours a day, every, every day, and maybe have one rest day a week, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I was just, just lifting like a beast. So, uh, yeah, no, you can get this. You can definitely get it on a carnivore diet. It's been easier to put on muscle and get lean on a carnivore diet than anything I've ever done before. And so just keep eating, uh, fatty red meat preferably. You don't need a bunch of uh, protein shakes or anything like that. You'll get hundreds of grams of protein just from eating steak and, uh, or, or whatever meat. And, uh, and then just work out, um, sprinting. Great. Hill sprints, even greater and, uh, lifting weights and going to failure. I go to muscle fatigue and exhaustion. That's how I just, I just work until I've worn out the muscle group. It's a lot harder on a carnivore diet. So I was doing like crazy sets. I was doing like 20 sets you know, like I think it was Metzger, you know, professional bodybuilder. He said, you just did sort of one set. He's like, oh, after that, you know, do two sets, three sets, whatever. He's like, yeah, sure. You get more work out of it, but you know, it, there's a detriment because it takes longer for you to recover. It didn't take any time at all for me to recover. Um, I, you know, I was doing this, um, I, I sometimes I could do it every day, but I thought that was stupid. I uh, wanted to let it rest. So I would, I was doing it every day. So I was doing 20 sets of bench, 20 sets of dips, 20 sets of flies, 20 sets of incline every other day. It was hours and hours and hours and hours. It was just ridiculous, but not all that much rest in between, and uh, you know, a couple minutes. And so, you know, it's um, you just recover so much better. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's better or not. I don't. We haven't really done tests and studies on on people that eat the way I do and recover as quickly as I do. Uh, Dr. Jaquish uh, is of the opinion that you don't want to do that. You just do one set to failure, especially with the bands, the banded exercises. And that's all you need to do. And you get sort of diminishing returns after that. Fair enough. Um, but either way, uh, you, you, however many sets you're doing, uh, and you know, three sets to failure is fair enough if you want to sort of split the difference. Um, and, uh, or even just one set to failure or whatever, if you're doing them sort of just slow and steady and doing them right, really good reps, good sets. Um, see so how you go, see what works for you, but, but just at least whatever you're doing, doing it to exhaustion where you're just really worn yourself out, get the whole body and consistency. That's the key. Whatever you're doing, work to failure. So push yourself and do it consistently. If you're going to go four days a week, like I do Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, without fail, you get those done. And other days are bonus. Maybe you want to do an extra leg day on Wednesdays, or you want to do sprints, on Saturdays, go for it. But those days are sacrosanct. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. That's that's my routine, and I, I'll, I'll add in other days. But I those days get done, and you just do that, and you keep doing that, and you keep working out. If you push yourself, up. now there's a difference. But I have friends of mine that well, I would go work out with, and they were like, "Oh yeah, I'm working out four days a week, five days a week, this and the other." I'm looking, at them, I'm like, "It doesn't look like you've ever been in the gym." And then we go. Uh, to the gym together once. And I, I realized why, because they really just didn't push themselves. You know, they do decent amount of weight, like on say bench and uh, they're just going, they're just going like, okay, yeah, you're doing great. And they just rip out 10 real easily. I'm like, great, man, keep going. And they just try to put it up. And I'm like, well, what are you doing, man? You're not done. And like, I try to like push back. No, Hey, keep going, keep going. And they're like fighting me to put it on. Literally this happened. A friend of mine uh, was just pushing it back. Like, no, no. And I was just like, I was leaning on it and pressing it back on and saying like, get down, do it another one. And he was able to force my body weight up and put this thing on the rack. It's like, I'm sorry. If you're able to lift the bar with all the weights and my body weight off the ground and put it on, on the rack, you clearly are not done, right? And so that's the thing. So they're doing some work, but they're not actually taxing themselves and stimulating that muscle growth. So that's what you want to do. And uh, yeah, you can, absolutely. You can absolutely get a fantastic physique. Uh, you just put in the hard work and eat the right food. And so carnivore is the right food. And I've just described the right work. So uh, you'll, you'll, you'll do fine, man. Just it has to be consistent. You have to keep it up. You know, it doesn't happen in two weeks. You know, you talk to people and say, you know, how's my, how are my legs look? How's my butt? Is it getting bigger? Like, you know, things like that. It's like, it's been two weeks. You know, you, you, you're doing great and you can notice difference in two weeks if you're working hard and you, and you, you know, and that, that is something that you can see, but you know, it just wait six months 
and then start looking or monthly, you know, take monthly pictures and all that sort of stuff. But it takes, it takes a long time, especially if you're coming from, from a zero baseline. If you're not, if you haven't really been working out a lot, um, you know, it's just, it's, it'll take time, but it will come. You just have to stay consistent. And so if you just go for a couple of weeks and then sort of peter out, you know, that's, that's not going to get you what you, where you want to go. Uh, super chat from Don. Thank you very much. Your in-depth, uh, and understandable responses are like no other. Thank you. Well, thank you, Don. I appreciate that. Um, I do try to make things, well, I do try to answer things thoroughly anyway, and, and sort of give people, uh, good answers. So, um, glad that people, uh, like that. So thank you. Uh, Diane Max. Thank you for the super chat. Hi, 52 and two months carnivore. I have a hole in my eardrum uh, that won't heal. Do you think this will help? Lost 10 kg so far and feeling great. I I don't know about that, unfortunately. Um, you know, the body does pretty great things when you give it what it needs. Um, and I've seen some uh, a lot of things heal. But, um, you know, if you've had a hole in your eardrum for a while, the likelihood of that growing back is, uh, you know, not high. But you never know. Um, I don't I don't know of anyone who has had that issue um, that's told me that that's resolved, but maybe someone in the chat, if you've, if you know of someone or you are someone who's had that same issue, maybe you can, um, address a, uh, a comment to die Max and, and let them know what you're experiencing that. Uh, Jacqueline Norton, thank you for the super chat. There's not a, a question attached, but maybe there's one down the line here. I'll take a look. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this replay of my YouTube live. If you'd like to catch a live version and ask your own questions, please go to the next scheduled one, usually every Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. All right, see you then, and please enjoy the rest of the Q&A. There we go. So Jacqueline asks, uh, can carnivore diet help with bursitis? I have been doing carnivore diet for two months now, not 100%, but doing the best I can and still suffering with bursitis. Any advice, please? So bursitis is just the inflammation of the bursa. So these bursa sacs that sort of are, are padding and lubricant for tendons and other sorts of moving parts in your body. And um, and it can be very painful when they, so itis just means inflammation. So it can get inflamed and, and, uh, and irritated and painful. Uh, carnivore diet really does help with inflammation and can really reduce the amount of inflammation one, because it removes out a lot of things that cause inflammation. And secondly, because when your ketones are up, ketones directly suppress inflammation. And so yes, you can get, uh, relief from that. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to cure everything, but it can reduce your the expression and your sensation of pain and, uh, and inflammation. Certainly if you're not doing it hundred percent, you're not going to get, you're not going to get all the results that you could get. So I don't know what, what, what version of this you're doing. If you're just eating more meat, but you're still eating carbs or fruit and sugar and things like that. If you're doing that, you're not in ketosis, your ketones aren't up. You're not going to be suppressing these, um, the, these inflammatory inflammasomes and things like that. And so, uh, that's not going to be as, as beneficial and you're sort of eating other things that can precipitate, uh, inflammation as well. Uh, so, you know, I would just give it a shot with just full 100% meat and water, only fatty meat and water, only the high fat helps, uh, reduce, um, reduce the inflammation. So that's what I would do is just give that a shot. It will reduce inflammation. Will that relieve all of your problems and cure your issue? Can't say, uh, but it, it does help a lot of people and they, they find that their expression of pain is much reduced, uh, on, on this way of eating. Definitely. And some people find complete re resolution of their symptoms, which is amazing. And so, yeah, just, just, uh, try it full on for at least 30 days and see how you go. Edward, thank you for the super chat. Started carnivore diet six days ago. I have ankylosing spondylitis, uh, waking up near pain free all week until today. Had a beer yesterday. Time to quit. Thanks, doc. Yeah. Well, there you go. Um, yeah. Well, look, six days already, and your and your your ankylosing spondylitis is is improving. That's fantastic, and that's just a testament to the fact that it's it's what we're eating that's increasing inflammation, increasing our our uh, antibodies that attack ourselves, and so you get rid of those and problem goes away and then you, you have a beer and then, you know, it comes right back. And so that's, you know, it's a good test and it's good proof positive that you're doing the right thing. So, you know, really good job, 
recognizing that and um, and using it to to um, you know to to reinforce your commitment to getting better. So well done, Edward, and uh, I look forward to hearing uh, how well you're doing in the coming months. Homestead House, my buddy Carrie, how you doing, man? This looks like you sent that. Jesus Christ, an hour ago. Sorry, buddy. Uh, but he says, 100%, Dr. Chafee, your voice will be uh, a vital part in the Carnivore documentary. Appreciate you, and thanks uh, for helping so many. Well, well, thank you, buddy. It's good to see you. And uh, so, sorry, it's just taking me longer to, to get through these um, than oh, it just normally takes this long. But uh, but yeah, <clears throat> really excited for that, for Carrie's project and, and the Carnivore documentary. If you want to check out his YouTube channel there, the Homestead How. <clears throat> he originally had it as, as a homesteading YouTube channel and grew that up pretty big. Uh, and then discovered Carnivore and really helped him and his family and just went, whoa, this is crazy, and used that platform to um <clears throat> use that platform to uh you know just show like how great um the carnivore diet is for people. And so that, that's, that's really awesome because he, had, he already had a big platform and was able to reach a lot of people that, that wouldn't have really come across this. And, um, yeah, so that's awesome. So yeah, he's doing great work because people should check his, his stuff out. Uh, send it media. Thank you very much for the super chat. 24, two months on carnivore lost 25 pounds, still about 20, 30 pounds overweight, have high blood pressure, just checked it and it was 170 over 87 on lisinopril. Any advice on how to lower it and come off meds? So 24 is really young for having that high of blood pressure. So A, stay on your blood pressure medication. But you know, you need to talk to your doctor because there there are other things that can be um causing high blood pressure that could be uh, you know that, that that you know just normal blood pressure medication isn't isn't really helpful with and there's other other reasons why you can have high blood pressure that's you know pretty pretty high and and difficult to control with blood pressure medication normal blood pressure issues again can come down to insulin resistance and uh, so going on a ketogenic diet a carnivore diet can significantly reduce uh the need for blood pressure medications when, when our body starts recovering. Um, so hopefully that's the case, but you know, if it's not doing, and so full on carnivore, no carbs, no sugar, no fruit, no honey, no anything like that, just fatty meat and water. That's it. And, um, and if that's not doing the trick and helping, and also because you're 24 and your blood pressure should not be that high, uh, talk to your doctor and get investigated for the the sort of the less common but more serious types of blood pressure uh, because that's you need to rule those out in your case because at 24 uh, that's yeah, I mean unless you were like 400 pounds overweight your blood pressure should not be that high so it's there's there's a greater suspicion that there's something else going on um, and one of these these less common, causes of blood pressure that you have to investigate you just have to investigate especially in your in your case keep going with just pure uh red meat and water for best results fatty as you can and um yeah and just just uh, talk to your doctor about investigating some of those those other causes of high blood pressure okay just trying to work our way down here to some of the other questions a lot of conversations going on here, which is great. It's like so many different conversations going on that have nothing to do with me. It's funny. There's people chatting away, which is great. DC Learning to Live, thank you very much for the super chat. Hey, Doc, thank you for all you do. You are amazing. Question. Well, thank you, first of all. Question. I'd love to do an interview with you on managing cancer uh, with carnivore diet. Would you be interested? Uh, I'm so... An interview like interviewing me um or or something you wanted to talk about yeah no I'm absolutely happy to um just email me so i have my little for contacts and collaboration uh, you know for collaborating on on things like that i have my email in the description for most of my youtube um things and podcasts and it's just anthony at gmail.com just shoot me an email 
and uh, yeah, we can we can discuss it. Sounds good. Liberty Threads Clothing, thank you very much for the super chat. Should I introduce fruit to help bulk on carnivore? Um, well, if you want to bulk fat, maybe. But um, no, I, I don't think you need that. No, you definitely don't need that. Um, if you want to put on lean muscle mass, the easiest way to do that is eating uh, a fatty carnivore diet, hands down. I've never put on muscle easier, more easily. And it's just it's lean, lean muscle mass. So if you're... If you're eating carbs and fruit and all that sort of stuff, sure, you'll 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 look a bit bulkier, but that's going to be fat and glycogen that you're putting into your body and your muscles. So if that's what you want, you want to go for a look, like you did carnivore all the way up to a, a, a bodybuilding competition, and then you ate some carbs and fruit the night before, and your muscles swelled up with the glycogen. Fine, but that's not actual muscle mass. You're not actually bulking with real muscle. It's just giving you the illusion of muscle. It's just looking bigger, but it's not bigger. It's just puffing up your muscles. It's like you know, injecting oil and things like that into the muscles and having them look all bulky and weird. Not the same thing. You know, they may look like they have big muscles, but they don't have big muscles. They have uh, you know, weird stuff mixed in with the muscles. So, yeah, you don't need to do that. Uh, just eat fatty meat until you stop tasting good and work your ass off and you'll, you'll put on a lot of muscle. Laurel Rotor, thanks for the super chat. There's no question attached, but I'll look at one here. There we go. So Laurel says 66 year old female keto with intermittent fasting, 24 to 48 hours, one to two days a week, lost 30 pounds in two years. Great. Carnivore for two months too hungry to fast, not losing weight, but feel amazing. I miss autophagy and fasting ideas, 20 pounds to go. So you get autophagy on carnivore. So you get autophagy, you get mitophagy just by not eating carbohydrates and having your insulin low. So if you're doing carnivore, you will be getting that. And that's, that's why we get that with fasting is because, you know, it's, uh, it's getting us into the metabolic state that we're supposed to be in anyway. And we would be in all the time if we were eating what we're supposed to eat, which is a carnivore diet. Um, too hungry to fast. Maybe it sounds like you may not be eating enough. Really shouldn't be all that hungry. Normally people's hunger signals are much more suppressed and subdued. Uh, so if you're feeling hungry all the time, you probably need to eat a lot more. And if you're eating too little and you're chronically under eating, you're going to lower your metabolism and you're going to stall your weight loss. And so, you know, you just want to eat until fatty meat stops tasting good. And generally, that will will trigger will trigger uh, more weight loss. Um, but you you are already um, going to be uh, experiencing autophagy and recycling of your of your cells and and uh, the organelles within the cells as well. Because you, it's not just the whole cells that get turned over; that you can swap out parts inside the cell as well. So it's just like you're you know, your radiator goes out in your car. You don't have to get a new car. You can replace the radiator. And, and that's, and that's part of autophagy is replacing individual components of the cell and making it, making them work better. So yeah, you, you get that with just a carnivore diet. You don't have to fast. So you'll be fine. Um, what was that? So Nope just says, thank you so much for going through these questions, Dr. Chafee. Well, you're very welcome. And, you know, hopefully, um, you know, this, this, these questions, these answers are helpful to people and, um, and the people get something out of it. So, okay. So I've got about, um, ooh, Christmas. So I've got about a maximum of, of an hour to go guys. Um, because I've got, a, I've got uh, some calls to make after this. So I'm going to just try to get through the rest of the super chats and, um, and so maybe, uh, you know, we'll see where we're at at the end of the super chats, but uh, probably, you know, don't send any more because I, I don't want to not get to them. Uh, so the next sort of 30 minutes to an hour, I, I'm going to need to wrap up. Um, but I'll get through all the super chats anyway. Asylum, uh, thank you very much for the super chat. Two months carnivore. Uh, I'm having trouble with my athletic performance in BJJ. Everything is amazing besides my cardio and strength. Well, it, it just depends on what you're doing um, and when you're eating. So if you're if you're working out 
on a carnivore diet, uh, you, you generally want to work out fasted. You don't, you want to work out on an empty stomach. I always trained on an empty stomach. I always played on an empty stomach. I always competed on an empty stomach. Even before I, I knew why that was, I just felt naturally a lot better when I did that. And if I would eat during the day, I would eat a smaller meal during the day. And, uh, but preferably I wouldn't eat anything until after I trained. And that was even just in school sports. You know, if I was wrestling, you know, after school, I, I didn't want, I was just like, well, I was like, oh, she eat less. I was like, oh, I don't know if I really want to do that because I got a big workout today in wrestling. And, um, but you know, several hours sort of generally between, but even then I would, I would notice it. So, um, you know, with, with any sort of, you know, martial arts and BJJ and those sorts of things, like you, you really want to be on an empty stomach because when you're, when you eat food, it just, you're pushing, you know, blood to your intestines and your, 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 yeah, you know, that's blood that's not available to your brain and your muscles. Right. And you go into a rest and digest phase and your body just says, Ooh, Hey, why are we fighting? Why are we struggling? Why are we fighting? And just chill out. We got our food for the day. You know, take a nap, take it easy. You, your job's done. So, you know, just remember that. Um, you need to eat enough, right? But you need to eat enough at the right time. So, you know, if you're going to eat during the day, eat a smaller amount, just a bit to take the edge off. Um, but preferably eat after and then eat a lot, a lot of fatty meat and, uh, you know, have a Brazilian barbecue afterwards. And, um, and, uh, and then hopefully that'll be good for the next day. You know, if you need, need to eat a bit of, you know, the next morning or, or during the day, just, have a have a small amount to take the edge off so you're not crash throughout the day and and you know five hours plus before your your uh, training and that's what I would do make sure you get enough water get make sure you get enough sleep um, as well those are all the normal normal sort of things but you know just uh, you know, as far as as far as eating is concerned make sure you're eating enough and make sure you're eating at a time that's not interfering with your workouts and uh, and good luck with it. Carnivorous dude, thank you for the super chat. Thoughts on deuterium overdose due to GMO? So that's a good question. I I don't know the difference in deuterium load. Deuterium being heavy hydrogen, um, I don't know that of of the differences in deuterium loads in GMOs. I do know that there's a lot more deuterium in you know plants and that we eat. And when you're eating carbohydrates, we, you, it raises your deuterium load as well. Um, and because you're just not getting rid of enough of it. When you're not eating carbohydrates, you make molecular water. And so, uh, or metabolic water, I always say that wrong metabolic water, because you're, you're, you're making water, uh, when you're burning fat. So for every, uh, one gram or one kilo of, um, every one kilo of fat that you burn, uh, in your mitochondria, you produce 1.1 liters of um, metabolic water, which is deuterium free. And so, you know, that lowers your overall deuterium levels. And um, looks like I got a little visitor here. Hey, buddy. And, um, and so that goes down. So you're eating any sort of plants and especially, uh, you know, grains and carbs and things like that then you're going to raise your deuterium, which is, which is harmful. It actually damages your body, damages your mitochondria. And, you know, as we're, we're quickly discovering the mitochondria are vital for overall health. You damage your mitochondria. They don't work properly. Your cells don't work properly. Your brain doesn't work properly. Your hormones don't work properly. And, uh, and we don't work properly. So we get a lot of, uh, um, uh, metabolic issues and serious diseases from that. So I uh, don't know if it's different for GMOs though. So send it media. Um, thank you for the super chat. 24 and carnivore lost 25 pounds, 25 to go in great shape. I have high blood pressure currently on lisinopril, but would really like to come off meds. So I think this was, this was the previous one uh, where I had a blood pressure of 170. Uh, so yeah, just um, yeah, there is a delay guys. So uh, I will, I will get to all of these. Um, but uh, so, uh, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so I answered that question earlier. So you can go back and look at that, but that's um, that's uh, just you, you shouldn't be that high of a blood pressure at that age. You need to go talk to your doctor and see if uh, there there might be something else causing the high blood pressure. There are certain investigations and tests to do for for people, and certain people have uh, some of these rare 
reasons why they get high blood pressure and, and then you need to know about it because like the blood pressure medication doesn't always help and it isn't enough. You need to do, do other things as well. And so just check that out and keep doing carnivore. Um, and so that'll take care of those reasons for high blood pressure anyway. And then just, yeah, just talk to your doctor about uh, the other ones. So Joan Eichner, thank you very much for the super chat. 51 year old female keto off and on for years, found it hard to limit the keto snacks. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's the problem with, with these snacks is they're, they're designed to be just as addictive as the other processed food and things like that. You know, they just the sweeteners, the artificial sweeteners, these things seem to be addictive hitting, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, centers in your brain, like that just say, Oh, Hey, look, that's sugar, that's drugs. That's what I want. Uh, or something else. I, I I've talked to a lot of people that say it's harder to come off artificial sweeteners than it was to come off sugar. <laughs> Excuse me. And, um, you know, so, uh, yeah, I would, I would definitely avoid those things, uh, because they can, they, you, you don't limit them. They're designed to not be limited. So she goes on and says that she's a, a former chef and restaurant owner. That's very cool. 101 days on carnivore. Cravings instantly gone. Fantastic. Uh, 25 pounds down and most health issues have disappeared. Awesome. So that that's fantastic. And, you know, and just a testament to that, you know, keto is, is great. You're getting rid of a lot of things that are harm for you, harmful to you and, and, and really addressing the major metabolic issues of, of high insulin and blood sugar, which are very damaging. <laughs> But there are other things that are damaging as well. And you'll just like the artificial sweeteners and the snacks and all the different uh, vegetables that don't have uh, sweeteners in it or, or sugar and carbs in, in it as well. I mean, they, these things cause problems as well. So, uh, so that's great. So uh, really good, um, really good result there. And, and thank you very much for sharing that. So Angel Gordon, thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, very generous of you. I'm wanting to try this. I heard you talk about the MTHFR gene mutation in other videos. I have that along with factor five Leiden and prothrombin gene mutation. Would this be safe diet for me to try? Absolutely. With the factor five Leiden and prothrombin, um, you know, that those are just clotting issues that doesn't have anything to do with um, nutrition as far as, you know, are you going to absorb things that, that I know of? The MT MTHFR gene mutation just means you're going to need a bit more um, folate and, and potentially B12 as well. So you people in that situation just need to add in liver once or twice a week and not even all that much, just, you know, just a bit, just to keep those levels up and you should be, you should be more than fine. Uh, the, the clotting factors, um, those are risks, you know, when, if you're, if you are at a higher risk of clotting, that is an independent risk factor for, uh, strokes and uh you know, heart attacks and things like that so you know just something to know about um but i think that when you're on a carnivore diet it at least optimizes your genetics whatever they are and so i have no idea how that affects you know the factor five and the prothrombin issue uh, you know peculiarities that you have but um you know it's not going to cause harm anyway and it's going to benefit you in all these other ways. And the NP NTHFR gene mutation, that just means you just need liver once or twice a week. That muscle meat may not be enough for you. If you're getting, you know, wild game, you know, wild venison and moose and elk or, um, or you know, regeneratively raised, grass-fed and finished beef and lamb, goat, uh, probably don't even need that because they're, they're very, very nutrient dense. But, you know, if you're just getting sort of, you know, store bought, you know, uh, meat like the rest of us, then uh, add in a bit of liver once or twice a week and, uh, and you'll be fine. And it, and it can be any liver. It can be chicken liver, sheep liver, pig liver, cow liver, whatever. You can mix it up too. You know, it's fine. David Greenfield, uh, thank you for the super chat. What about pork? It's so much cheaper than beef. And uh, what about mushrooms? So mushrooms are a fungus. Um, so my hard rule is no plants or any fungus, nothing artificial, or, or sorry, uh, no sugar or any sweeteners, and nothing artificial. And that goes for sauces, seasonings, and drinks as well. So mushrooms grows out of the ground. Don't eat it. Um, if it doesn't have, uh, if it doesn't move and have a face, don't eat it. Um, and uh, or be limited. I you know I say the face thing because of 
of shellfish. Some people have, have actual shellfish allergies, so it's not, um, it's not safe for everyone, but, um, but pork is fine. It's totally fine. And if it, and if you do well on it, then that's totally fine because that's the main thing is, uh, is how you do with it. Some, you know, most of the pork that we get is factory farmed, you know, from China and they're just fed a bunch of soy and garbage like that. So they have high linoleic acid content. They have, uh, different sorts of things that they can't filter out properly because they're not designed to. And so it's not as healthy, but not everyone has a problem with that. So, you know, if that's what's uh, good for your budget and you feel good on it and it's not causing you any problems, perfect. You know, just keep going with that and, uh, and, and do that. No, that's, that's perfectly fine if you're doing okay with it. If you have autoimmune issues or you have some sensitivities, you know, you, you're going to probably try to need to stick to red meat, but, you know, ground beef is perfectly fine and, uh, you know, and, and it's cheap. Brisket's really cheap as well, really cheap, and it's very fatty. And you can actually cut that up into steaks as well. Um, so, you know, I haven't done it myself, but I've, I've spoken to people who have, and they say, yeah, it actually cooks up fine. It's not all tough. It, it you know, it's, it's like you can eat it like a steak. It's fine. So there are cheap beef options as well. So, uh, but yeah, no, pork's fine. Um, R. Coleman, thank you so much uh, for the super sticker. I appreciate it. And Chris Schreiber, thank you very much uh, for the super chat. Hi, been doing great on Carnivore for the last two months. Feeling better than I ever thought possible. That's great to hear. Uh, unfortunately, I'm still vaping. Uh, talk some sense into me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, look. You know, I mean, you're you're doing a lot better because you've gotten rid of so many other things. But you know, I mean, you're, you're directly imbibing uh, and inhaling things that are not good for you. And God knows what's in those things. And we have, we have no long-term data on what the hell those little flavorings and sweeteners and weird ass things that they put in these, these gels. And they, 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 they vaporize these things and you're inhaling the stuff and your, your lungs are very, very sensitive to everything that you inhale. No one knows. No one knows what those things are, are going to do. Sorry, uh, just dropped something there. So, um, you know, it's not it's not something that uh, you really want to put in your body. You have no idea what this is doing to you. You know, there's some things like nicotine. Uh, well, if it, it does have nicotine, if you're just doing it for the flavor, then there's really no point. Uh, but, but if you're doing it for like the nicotine or something like that, uh, well, you know that that's that's not doing great things for you too. So let's assume it's nicotine. Nicotine, even if it's not in the form of a cigarette. That, that causes damage to your artery lining. And that's that damage is where things start going in and start forming plaques. And you get damage, clot, you know, build up a, a, a little clot and it sort of builds up some tissue. And then you break down again and build up, break down again and build up. And that's how you get atherosclerosis, right? You have, you have to have a damage. It's damage and repair. So the damage is where it starts with, right? So whether it's cholesterol or whether it's sugar or whether it's seed oils or whether it's whatever, it starts with the damage. If you don't have the damage, then there's nothing. There's no. There's no port of entry to invade in the first place. So uh, that would be my advice. Just get rid of it. You're doing great. You've done so much better, and you've gotten all this, all this out, all this stuff out of your system. Um, it's just the last step. And you know, if it is addictive, you know, addictions do go away. So after about two weeks. That's usually how long nicotine stays addictive to you. And, uh, and then it's just habits after that. You're used to doing it at certain times, and so you want to do it. You felt nice when you did it. Um, but after two weeks, the actual chemical addiction goes away. Generally recognized as six weeks to, to form new habits. So there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's not that long. Just, um, uh, you know, just, just do your best to stay away from it. And uh, for two weeks, and then you're, and now it's just a habit, and then you just form a new habit. And after a few more weeks, you'll have all new habits, and and you'll be you'll be good, and you won't have to worry about it again. So, uh, good luck with that. I'm sure you'll do. I'm sure you'll do great. Absolutely relative. Thank you very much for the super chat. Lost another ten pounds. Hey, that's great. Total sixty pounds in seven months. Fantastic. Uh, but it's uh, so much harder for me to eat more than twelve hundred kilocalories per day. 
My kilocalorie expenditure is between 800, 1800 and 2600 kilocalorie per day per Fitbit. As per the Fitbit, is this normal? Should I eat more? Well, normally, uh, people say that if you eat less than a certain amount, if you're trying intentionally to eat less than a certain amount, or if you are eating less than your body wants to a certain extent, it will be hard to lose weight and you can harm yourself. So uh, I've heard different bariatric surgeons say that that they tell their patients they have to eat at least 1,200 calories a day or they will not lose weight, even though it's difficult to eat that much. They have to try. Um, and uh, so... And then they can cause problems from there. But if you're eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good and you're trying to do that at least once a day, sometimes twice a day just to see, and that's how much your body wants, it's how much your body wants. But make sure it's not just while I feel satisfied, right? Make sure it stops tasting good, that there's a difference. So you keep eating meat. If, it, if you take a bite and go like, yeah, that tastes pleasant, keep eating, Right. You finish the steak and go like, yeah, that was nice. Make another one and keep eating until you take a bite that goes, mm, didn't really enjoy that. I don't really want to take another bite. That's when you know you're done. And so if that's 1,200 kilocalories, it's a 1,200 kilocalories. It doesn't matter. It's whatever your body is telling you to do. And as long as you're listening to that, I think you'll be fine. Most people will be fine doing that, especially if you have a lot of weight to lose. Your body's going to prioritize using that. If you're giving yourself enough nutrients and your body says, okay, we don't need to store this. We don't need to save this for a rainy day. We're good now. Um, so yeah, just keep doing that and just make sure you're eating enough and you'll be fine. Rachel Gard, thank you very much for the super chat. Hey, Dr. Chafee, um, you should interview at hang GNG or maybe at hanging, hanging with the Browns probably. They have an awesome story. Okay, cool. I'll I will take a look at that. Great. Thank you for the suggestion. I'll take a look. Puppy Love and Unicorn. Thank you for the super chat. Just wanted to say thank you for all the information. My name is Travis. I'm 48. Been on a strict ribeye and lamb regimen for uh, 70 days and down 40 pounds. Awesome. Uh, I'm now hitting the gym and feel like I'm in my 20s. That's great. Yeah, and I I, I do as well. I, I have crazy stamina in the gym. I feel amazing when I go. Actually, you know, I go in there I'm like like last night. I wasn't. I almost didn't go because it was just late and I'd been not getting enough sleep last few nights. I was like, no, I'm just going to do it. Not making no excuses. And uh, just went in there. And at first I was just dragging and just didn't feel great. But then when I started going, I started feeling better and better. And actually, I didn't want to leave at the end. Um, but it was late. So I had to go. But so that's uh, so that's great. And, and uh, 40 pounds in 70 days is fantastic. Uh, just so you know, you start lifting weights, you start working out, you're going to start building muscle. And that's going to offset the fat that you're losing on the scale. So you're going to still lose weight. You're going to still, sorry, you're going to still lose fat, uh, but you're going to put on muscle. So it may not be that you're losing weight quite as fast, or maybe you start putting on weight or stay the same. I certainly experienced that same thing. And a lot of guys who start working out and lifting weights regularly experience that same thing. So just be mindful of that, that, you know, and, and just go by your appearance, how your clothes are fitting, how you feel uh, first and foremost. So yeah, great, great job. Good to hear that. Jennifer Skinner, thank you for the super chat. Can I please be a moderator or, or can you think about um, getting a couple? Some people have no shame, uh, but you need some. Yeah, well, you know, sure. I don't know how to do that. I, I have no idea how to do that, actually. <laughs> but I'll, I'll see if people can uh, uh, can do that. Um, yeah, so it's Jennifer again. Uh, can I be a moderator or at least get a couple for you? Some people have no shame. You need moderators for sure. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I will think about that, um, and see what I can do. Um, uh, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, I don't know if have people been uh, a bit obnoxious in, in the chat. I'm not, I, you know, because I'm, I'm sort of skimming through looking for questions. So I don't, I don't know all, but there are a lot of chat and there are a lot of people, um, yeah, potentially saying all sorts of garbage. So, so God knows. Um, I should be able to, 
to, to figure out how to do moderators. Uh, I'll take a look. Um, Bernie, love your lives. Thank you for the super chat. Well, thank you very much, Bernie. I appreciate that. And Snipe Force, thank you for the super chat. Can carnivore help with old people smell? I've, I've seen something on Google about um, uh, nonal and uh, and it being related to omega seven oxidation when we get older. Nonanol. Uh, don't know. I've never heard of that. Um, there, I mean, there can be a certain smell. You know, sometimes you have a certain smell about when people are are old and sick and very unwell and it's sort of a particular smell that you get in the hospital when people are, are particularly unwell and um and so sometimes you notice that so i don't i don't know exactly what that is but i've, I've definitely noticed that and you know it's interesting because animals and cats and dogs and things like that when they have them at at like a a a nursing home or something like that um, there's, you know, there's weird stories about, you know, like a dog or a cat that will just stick by someone and just stay with them. And there's like a cat that will go and just stay with someone, and just lay with them and just comfort them and be with them. Um, and then they, you know, they die shortly after that. And it's just like, so the cat sort of could tell that there was something going on there and that they wanted to be with them and comfort them. Or maybe that something death smell attracted them. I don't know. God knows, but it, um, there, there've been stories about that, you know, where animals sort of go and, and, uh, can sense something probably through smell and dogs have been trained to smell different tumors and things like that, which is pretty wild. I don't know how accurate that is, but you know, I've heard things like that. So, um, I, I, I don't, I don't know uh, about the old person smell thing, but it can definitely make you healthier. And, um, and that's a good thing too. And so hopefully that helps any of the unhealthy, not doing too well smells that, uh, that, that maybe can get there and, and fix that sort of thing as well. Um, hopefully. And then Paolo Souza, thank you very much for the super chat. There's not a question there, but maybe, maybe I can see if there's one down here. My God, there's a lot of these things. Jesus. Right, maybe I do need a moderator. There's a lot of weird ass things. Jesus Christ. All right, well, maybe that guy just needs to be. Yeah, why don't we just, why don't we just, All right, I saw one person doing some Stupid shit. So I just uh, blocked his ass. What is wrong with these people? Um, here's a quick one right here. Murray Nathan question: Bacon versus ground pork. Do they provide equal nutrition? Uh, probably pretty similar. Um, depends on the fat content and the fat description, you know, it depends on how the pigs were raised. If they're feeding them a bunch of soy and corn and things like that, they're going to have higher levels of, of linoleic acid, which aren't great. Bacon just is pork. It's just fatty pork. Um, and depending on how you make that, it, um, can be better or worse for you if they add sugar and, and different sorts of ingredients and artificial ingredients and things like that. It's not, uh, it's not great. Um, so, uh, but yeah, basically if it's coming from the same pig, it's still pig. It's just the same as, as, you know, uh, brisket and steak or ground beef from the same cow. It's going to have the same nutritional value given similar portions of, of, um, of, uh, some of the portions of fat and and uh, and lean, so yeah, that that should be fine. Dude, there are some weird, bloody things on here. Um, Jesus Christ! Oh, that guy's got to go too. Jeez, what's wrong with people? This is some lunatics. Um, that's <laughs> screaming out for mods. Okay, I'll 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 find some mods. Where's some mods? Maybe I can see if there's um, 
some of the people on like my, my Patreon and things like that that uh, want to be moderators. Let's see. Jesus Christ, come on. Where are we going here? Sorry, I'm just, we're, we're, there are a lot of comments, so I'm, I'm just trying to work my way through these things. Um, dude, what is wrong? What is going on here? Jesus Christ. All right. Jesus age mother. Oh my good God. Okay. What do we got? Okay. Well, let's, let's find that lady who wanted to be a moderator and make her a moderator. And little, little boy. Oh, hey, buddy. And there's Paolo. That's good. That's a good start. I think she was just above that. Mm, there's the old people smell one. Hey, little guy. Okay. So can I be a moderator? I, I don't know how to make you a moderator. <laughs> Let me see. Maybe I can do it on YouTube. Um, oh, little boy, come here. All right, sorry. Uh, if people have questions, talk amongst yourselves, things like that, and I will try and find how the hell to make someone a moderator. Come on. What's going on here? Come on, why won't it bloody well? Um, fine, be fit to be fit. You can be a, you can be a moderator. And I have to find this other person. There you go. Your moderator. Please don't. Uh... Oh, Jesus, what is with these people? Jesus, God almighty, what is wrong with these people? Sam, absolutely ridiculous things. Um, okay, so Jesus, all right. All right, I'm going to try to find Paul Salzo's. Let me see. Um, okay, so I found Paul Salzer's one. I can't, I can't put it up, but I found it here on the other chat. So I'm 78, good shape, but decide to try the carnivore diet now for one week and feeling good. Great. My concern is what impact all the meat and fat will have on gout as I have them from uh, time to time. So um, when people have, well, we've been treating gout as a, as a, a medical establishment since the 1800s with a pure red meat and water diet. So I think you'll be fine um, when you get rid of all the sugar and fructose and alcohol and things like that. Uh, you generally won't get gout. Um, maybe you might have a, a flare up or two, um, uh, you know, early on, but that will go away. 
and uh, and then they'll stay away. So I don't I don't think that that's going to be a problem for you. But just see how you go. You probably won't have a flare up. If you do, it will go away, and uh, it they generally don't really come back after one or two one or two goes, and then you're and then you're good. Um, let's see here as well. What I want. How do I get Jennifer? Jennifer Skinner. It's not letting me put you in as a, as a moderator. It's not, for some reason, it doesn't let me put on moderators that gave super chats for some stupid reason. So Jennifer, maybe send another chat and I'll make you a moderator too. Uh, where are you? Let me see. Um, there okay see if there's jennifer has any any other jennifer skinner why won't it let me i'd use a moderator that's weird okay i don't know what the hell's going on here briar rose why oh, i have to do it on i have to do it on youtube that's why Ugh, oh, this is annoying. Okay. What is wrong with these people? A lot of things wrong with these people. I think everyone, yeah. So it's, thank you for pointing out this, this nonsense. nonsense. Um, Nazis, right. Um, okay. All right, so people are saying that that's got it for now. Let's see, where the hell is everyone else? Um, let me try and find some people I know here. Jennifer Skinner, I'm still here. There you go. And now you're a moderator. Great. And if um, Rachel Marion, can I be your moderator too? Um, let's see. Oh, come on. Who else? <laughs> um, all right, I'll have to figure this out. Who else is going on here? All right. Well, maybe that's enough for now. Are they still doing it? I've, I've blocked a number of these idiots. So hopefully that's good. Um, okay. I don't know. I think that's enough. <laughs> All right. So we've got a couple moderators. Um, and and we got these the idiots out of there, so that's good. And uh, yeah, and if people saying be careful, you pick as moderators. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm I'm with you on that. That's um, that's that's why I never sort of picked moderators. But uh, uh, either way, we'll start with those two, and uh, at least I can I can keep track of that, and um, and uh, you know, and that'll be fine. And then maybe some people that from my, I'll ask my, my Patreon members if they uh, would like to moderate and things like that, because um, that, uh, that's sort of easier because I have more contact with them and, and I know them. So, okay. All right. Well, um, let's see. I think I got a couple more super chats here towards the end. Um uh, I'll just go through these and then and then we'll wrap up. So thanks. Weird little hiccup there. Thank you everyone for being patient. Um, but uh, you know, yeah, that's uh, that was a bit weird. There are people saying some pretty obnoxious stuff, and I don't always see that. So thank you all for keeping an eye out. Absolutely relative. Thank you for the super chat. Thank you for your answer. Just to confirm, I should continue reading. Even I'm, I'm assuming eating, even if I am no longer hungry, if the meat continues to taste good. Yes. So that's the thing. Your, your hunger signals and, and, and are going to be different. 
So you're not going to feel hungry like you have before. And so I think that if it tastes good or tastes bad, that's a better indicator of whether you're hungry or not. So if fatty meat tastes good, that's your body telling you, yes, you are hungry, keep eating this, even though you don't feel traditionally hungry like you normally do. So just keep eating until it stops tasting good. And uh, I, I think that's the best way to do it because you can definitely under eat on a carnivore diet because you just don't feel hungry. Just don't feel hungry like you normally do. And so uh, I did this, you know, when I was doing this 20 something years ago, I was definitely under eating and I was, I wasn't eating for days at a time. And I was just like, I'm not, I'm, I'm starting to lose energy. I'm starting to not feel as good. I'm starting to feel worse for having worked out as opposed to better. So I was like, okay, something's wrong. It must be because I'm just not eating a lot, but I'm, I'm, I'm just not hungry. What the hell is going on? So I figured I just, okay, I just have to eat. I'm just going to eat every day, no matter what, you know, because this is just something weird's going on. I didn't know what it was. Now I know. And so you just, you just need to eat. And so eat, keep eating until fatty meat stops tasting good. And that's how you know. And you'll relearn your hunger signals. And you just sort of think about it. Say, is this what hunger feels like? Is this what satiety? What does this feel like? Try eating meat. If it tastes good, you're hungry. Keep eating it until it stops tasting good. And if it doesn't taste good, you know, no, you're not hungry. You don't need to keep eating. And uh, and just go go by that. Uh, Lynn Sixley, uh, thank you for the super chat. Not seeing any question though. Um, so maybe there's one further down, um, mad have, uh, diamond. Thank you for the super chat back in 2021. I had chest pain and left hand pain got better in five minutes. Okay. Went to the doctor after three months and echo and ECG came uh, back. All right. Uh, was that heart or stress? Oh, it's hard to say, you know, if you don't catch those things at the time, you know, it's not really, it's not easy to tell exactly what it is. I mean, it, and certainly people can get chest pain, specific chest pain, uh, cardiac related feels like there's like a weight or a pressure, someone sitting on your chest or like an elephant sitting on your chest. Like, Oh, that doesn't feel good. And then you can have radiating pain down your left arm, but not, not everyone does get that radiating pain or maybe the side of their neck or their jaw. They can get that radiating pain, but not always. And so it can be atypical and, and in women, they're more likely to have atypical ones that don't have any of those sort of classic symptoms. Uh, but even in men, not everyone does as well. So it's different for different people. Um, but I mean, the good thing is, is that if your echo and your ECG were fine, there wasn't any signs of damage, then even if that was cardiac related, it seems like it didn't do any permanent harm, which is, which is the important thing. So it's hard to tell if that was cardiac related previously. Um, but good news is your heart's working good now and that there isn't a sign of, of an old heart attack, which sometimes you can see. Um, and so that's, that's the good news anyway, is that, is that your heart's working well now? But mod me. Okay. <laughs> yes. <Yeah, so, laughs> uh, awesome. So, uh, beef is fifth. Yeah. So already gave up super mod. Great job. Thanks for stuffing those people down. Um, Tamson, thank you for the super chat. Hi doc. My muscles get fatigued and burning, uh, feeling easily on carnivore diet after one and a half months and was even worse on keto diet starting seven years ago. First time I did it was two and a half years ago. Second time, eight months. Why is that? Um, oh, that's interesting. Um, well, I mean, there's not necessarily much reason apart from, you know, potentially, you know, not being quite keto adapted yet. But if you did it for two and a half years, you know, or even eight months, you should definitely be keto adapted at that point. Your, your body will be making enough uh, energy and be able to make enough ATP um, aerobically and anaerobically. And so you shouldn't you know, necessarily be, be building up an untoward amount of lactic acid uh, and burn. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I don't get burned out or pain or anything like that. I haven't heard of other people getting that as well. Um, so I don't know if it's, you know, is it just that you're working harder and able to work harder and able to push yourself harder and, that's causing more intensive a burn. I don't know. Is it that you're doing the same amount of reps, but with carbohydrates, you can do more reps of the same weight and the same intensity 
without getting as much of a burn? Um, I don't know. So I would play around with that anyway. You know, if it's if it's that you can just push yourself harder and work harder, then that's great. Um, if it's one and a half months and then it clears up later, then it's probably that that uh, keto adaption, that fat adaption. But you know, two and a half years if you're doing that, then you know that that's a bit odd. Um, but yeah, I would just keep going with it. And, uh, and hopefully it, it sort of resolves on its own. If you're doing keto and you're eating other things apart from just meat, then, you know, God knows what those things were, were doing with you. Um, if you're eating any artificial sweeteners, I would definitely get rid of those because those can, can screw up your energy dynamics as well. Um, and yeah, I haven't really heard that before. I certainly haven't heard people getting more easily fatigued and more of a burn on a carnivore diet. Uh, I certainly haven't experienced that. So maybe play around with what you're eating, eat, you know, try to eat, make sure you're getting enough food and things like that. You're not under eating and getting fatigued in that way, or, and you're getting enough water as well. Sometimes your water demands increase and you're just, your fluid balances change on a keto carnivore diet. Um, so electrolytes might be beneficial as well to help retain in some water. Most people don't need it, especially after a month and a half, but just see how you go and, uh, you can play around with those sorts of things. Try playing around with your hydration, how much you're eating. Don't eat before you work out, only eat after you work out, make sure you're getting a lot of water, um, and play with the electrolytes, see if that helps at all. And, uh, and if you're drinking coffee, stop. Or make me mad. Um, um, okay, I, I might be able to do that. We'll, we'll see. Um, these, thank you very much for the super chat. This will be uh, the last one, everyone, and uh, and then I'll have to to bounce off to some other meetings. But thank you, thank you all very much. But so these says I am type two diabetic and saw a glucose spike after eating a big steak. I understand this is a gluconeogenesis. Should I eat less red meat? and increase fat. Um, well, yeah. So look, if you're, if you're, you should, you want to be eating a lot of fat anyway, you know, generally gluconeogenesis is, is demand driven as opposed to substrate driven. You're going to get a bit of a bump in your blood sugar and your insulin, but it, it's, it's going to be small. It's going to be transient and that's okay. You know, the, it, it doesn't really matter one way or the other, as long as you're eating what's physiological, because if you're eating what your body's designed to eat, then it's doing what it's designed to do. So if you go out of ketosis and then back in, fine. If you're staying in ketosis all the time, fine. If you've never gone in ketosis and you're just eating meat, I don't care. I have no idea what my ketones are. I have no idea what my blood sugar is because I'm going on first principles that this is what my body's designed to do. This is what our species is designed to do. We're designed to eat meat. And that's a fact. We've been eating meat for millions of years. And so that's what we're biologically adapted and designed to do. And so whether we're uh, you know, designed through nature or designed through God and whatever, we are designed to eat meat. And so if we eat meat and, uh, and nothing else, then we're going to work the way we're supposed to work. And so if that means your blood sugar goes up a bit and your insulin goes up a bit, fine. You know, if you're type two diabetic and you're still very insulin resistant, you're, you're going to see bigger spikes just because your body doesn't, doesn't control these things as well as others, but eventually that'll calm down and, and you'll get back to where, uh, other people would be without diabetes. And so, um, you know, eat a lot of fat, definitely eat a lot of fat, like ribeye level of fat, or maybe even a little bit more. Uh, you want to get a gram to two grams of fat per one gram of protein. And so that, uh, that's a lot of fat. That's a lot more fat than most people think. Um, they should they should eat or ever have eaten before. So just uh, just um, you know just just uh, don't worry about that. If you're on medication for your diabetes, continue on your medication for diabetes. Work with your doctor to come off of that when and as you can, because you will have a less and less demand for that, and your body will. Uh, re reverse its insulin resistance and its demand for so much insulin and so much and the blood sugar spikes and uh, will start leveling off. And uh, but yeah, definitely eat a lot of fat, fatty meat, and uh, and then after that, just let your body get on with it. You know, if your if your blood sugar goes up a bit, so be it. I have no idea. You know, I got a constant glucose monitor from uh, 
uh, Dr. Casey Means. She has a company called Levels. And I just did an interview with her. Very interesting um, interview that people uh, that will, will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. And um, and so she sent me uh, one of these constant glucose monitors, and I'll be interested just to see sort of what happens. But it's purely academic for me. You know, it's just like I eat a steak, and that's what happens. Interesting. That's what happens when you eat a steak. Great. And this is what it is when I'm not eating steak. Lovely. That's interesting. Or when I work out, it's it's purely academic to me because I'm I'm convinced that I'm doing what my body's designed to do. And so if I do what my body's designed to do, it's going to do what it's designed to do. And if that means it go my blood sugar goes up and my ketones go down and and then the reverse happens in other situations, fine. Uh, that's interesting, but it's not going to change anything that I do. So, you know, I mean, yeah, you know, you can see about how you're feeling and what you're doing and when you're eating and, you know, but I've, I've sort of figured that out anyway on just how I feel. I don't feel as good if I eat during the day because I get tired, I get lethargic, I don't have energy. Is that going to correspond with differences in my ketones and blood sugar? Quite possibly. But I already know that I don't feel great. You know, maybe I could track that and say, oh, when when my ketones are like this, my blood sugar is like that, I feel better. What did I do to get here? And then sort of reverse engineer it. But at least for me, I've, I've sort of already figured out when I feel good and, and how I can do it. And uh, and that's that, and those are the sort of things I suggest to other people that they try to figure out as well. Um, so for me, it's it's just, it's interesting. But, you know, I'm eating what I'm supposed to eat. My body's going to work the way it's supposed to work. And that's that's really all I'm, I'm concerned about. Uh, Matt have, uh, does erythritol make one anxious? I feel so, uh, potentially, you know, I, I don't know if we have any studies on that, but erythritol is just a weird chemical that's not supposed to be in your body. It's not something we're adapted to. It's not something we've been, uh, uh, developing with and, and, um, it's not something we've been exposed to for thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of years. So it's not something you want to put in your body. Anything that didn't exist 50,000 years ago in the last ice age in the ice, not something you want to put in your body for optimal health. That's my opinion anyway. Okay. All right, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for for uh, coming to the chat. Sorry for the weirdness. Thank you for the people that uh, <laughs> stepped up and helped out with with uh, the moderating. And uh, Jesus Christ, was there more of these people? What is wrong with these people? There's more of these bastards. Um, what horrible, nasty, racist ass pieces of shit. What's wrong with you? Oh, Jesus. Yeah, that's that's gonna that's gonna make everyone want to eat plants is, is you being racist. Yeah, great call, bloody idiots. Jesus Christ. Oh my god, there's more of these assholes. Fiona, I'm disappointed. Where are these pieces of shit? This guy, just just see the face of evil here. These are these racist assholes. And if you ever ever see them, just you know, just know that. Now you know what these little pieces of shit are, and you can just report them to YouTube. What bastards! All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep working my way through these little pieces of shit. More of them. Okay, so this is another one. It's another racist piece of shit. So everyone, go and and report their ass. Oh, and of course, my little Eloise is here. I didn't see you there, but she can be definitely be a moderator. Where are you? Say something again. So I can find your thing, L, if you're still listening. Briar Rose, you get to be a moderator. Briar Rose has been, even if you don't want to be a moderator, you are now a moderator. Um, let's see. Oh, trying to find L. Goodness. Oh, where's your thing? Do another chat, please. Oh, there he is. There we go. Now you're a moderator. 
Great. Okay. So I think we got some moderators. And um, and yeah, so we're good. So, all right. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry that that these idiots were out there causing trouble and just saying some really disgusting things. Um, but uh, thank you everyone for for coming on the chat and uh, for asking questions and for all the super chats. It's really, really, really uh, kind of you guys. And um, hopefully that was helpful to people and um, help people on their way and, and got gave them some good information that will help them uh, be successful going forward. So thank you very, very much, everyone. I'll see you guys next week. And I'll be putting out again another um, episode on Monday um, for, for a new uh, podcast and um, a YouTube episode. So uh, that will be that will be fun. So looking forward to that. Um, so if people can come to that, um, to that, uh, uh, live premiere that really helps generate, um, uh, uh that will tells the algorithm to really go out and, and push that out to people. And it really helps, helps the episode. So that will be, um, Friday afternoon, early evening in America, or sorry, Sunday, uh, afternoon, early evening um, Sunday in America and then Monday morning in Australia and middle of the damn night in, in Europe. So sorry about that. Um, but, um, probably around seven o'clock Monday morning is when I'll be putting it out on my time so that I can join, um, right before I start surgery on Monday. And, um, and that will be 7 PM Eastern time in the U S uh, 4 PM, uh, West coast time in the US. So hopefully, uh, you guys can all join there and we can get a big crowd and, um, we can get, um, uh, get a big crowd there and everyone hits likes and leaves comments and all that sort of stuff and shares out with people that will drive things. The, the Gary Fecky, if people haven't watched, um, episode with Gary Fecky, that thing's awesome. That guy's a legend and, uh, he has so much, uh, so much to say that's extraordinarily interesting. So if people haven't seen that. That's the one that came out this week. So go and check that out, share that around and, um, and it will be, uh, yeah. And it, it's, it's doing very well because a lot of you guys have been, uh, great about coming out and, and helping out on the premiere. And so that drove that, uh, to be very successful. And so a lot of people are getting out and really enjoying that. So thank you for that. Please help me do that on Monday as well. Seven o'clock Monday morning, 7 p.m. Eastern on Sunday, 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. So great. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Hope you have a great rest of your weekend and I will see you next time. I'll see you next week. Uh, well, I'll see you Monday and then next week, same time for the live. Thanks, everyone. Hey everyone, if you need a little extra help getting started on a carnivore diet and my online resources that I have for free aren't enough for you, you can go to www.howtocarnivore.com and sign up for a 30-day carnivore challenge where you'll have online resources, group support, weekly Zoom meetings, as well as the ability to chat live with myself, Simon Lewis, and the others in the challenge who can help you and support you and give you extra advice and help you along the way. So if that sounds like something that would be beneficial to you, then please go to howtocarnivore.com and sign up. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you there.